This doesn't work. Oh, I can do it manually. That's fine. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to our presentation today. Thank you for joining. So um, as uh, the introduction already kindly said, we are going to discuss neuromorphic computing today, and we're trying to cover quite a lot of, of different topics for the whole stack of, of technology here. So we're starting um, from the very basics of technologies, and we're going all the way up to the software stack, uh, thinking about compilers or how to make these systems running. And uh, to get you all interested in neuromorphic computing, I first want to get you like uh, given the vision. So, so why are we doing this? And um, so, so essentially, neuromorphic computing offers disruptive efficiency improvements. That's what is the key motivation to take a look at this topic. So in the age where, where Moore's Law is, is basically tempered down, we need to find new solutions. And neuromorphic computing is one of those solutions that is competing for, for being one of the next generation technologies. So um, the promises you will find in, in literature are quite bold here. So you'll find something like 100x increased energy efficiency, which would be huge, right, if we could get this. Or also you find um, um, 10x uh, improvements in terms of performance, so for instance, for latency for computing models. And uh, the core question is, is this like just some bold claims from scientists or is it really achievable? And um, to start this talk, I want to show you one actually manufactured chip from Stanford University called NURAM. It's a computing and memory chip, and um, they have uh, 48 cores on this. Um, yeah, so you have 48 cores on this with 3 million VRAM cells. And what you can see here is that for this chip, they um, say they get 1,320 teraops per watt uh, if you manufacture it on a 7 nanometer node. And as you probably all know who are working with um, machine learning accelerators, this is a really huge number. So something like your smartphone chip gets like 1 to 10 teraops per uh, for what? Um, so, so this would be a huge uh, thing if we can actually achieve that. And um, yeah, this is why neuromorphic computing is a relevant topic. And um, we want to discuss it today with you because we um, truly believe in that it can be um, one of the technologies that can uh, lead to, to more um, relevant systems in the future. So let's see. Oh, ah, it's getting back, I think. Yes, it's back. It's fine. Um, OK, so um, yeah, as I said, so this is like one of the, the things why we are doing this today as a motivation. So we as the speakers have already been introduced. Yeah, the slide isn't working anyway. So this was just the speaker slide. So um, Letizia and I'm going to, to cover this topic today. Um, Letizia is mainly working on test of integrated systems and emerging technologies. So she's going to discuss fault tolerance and test and reliability of neuromorphic computing memory chips. Um, I come more from the uh, system level perspective here, adding um, basically the software stack um, for this. And um, yeah, I did my postdoc in Georgia Tech on, on architectures for AI. And this is also where we are going to start off today because we understand neuromorphic computing basically as AI accelerators. Um, so we both are working at RWTH Aachen University in Germany. I just wanted to give you some background of where we are coming from. So as you all know, we are approximately located here. I think I hope I'm correct with the um, with the geography here. So we are located here in, in Europe, directly next, um, directly between uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. So this is Aachen here. Um, so <clears throat> that you have some idea where we're coming from. We have a very picturesque old town and uh, 45,000 students in the university, which is, I think, quite a large university. In terms of the agenda today, so um, yeah, I'm going to start with a short welcome and organization. So we have three large topics here. So the first is uh, the introduction that I'm going to give now, which is approximately going to be half an hour. Um, the, the key take home messages for you are, are listed here. So what we want to teach you here in this tutorial are the questions, what is neuromorphic computing? Why does it uh, promise to solve today's challenges? 
what technologies enable neuromorphic computing and what are the core challenges in this field. So this is like what you hopefully get back um, to or as a learning take home message from the introduction. Then um, we're going to go into the um, test with like one and a half hours approximately. Um, so here we're going to discuss uh, manufacturing uh, deviations and their impact behavior on novel devices, defects and fault models, manufacturing and test strategies, and the impact of undetectable faults on the reliability of novel devices during lifetime. Uh, we originally planned for a little bit different schedule for the breaks, but since we have like one global break, we will start with the introduction and then directly um, start with this part, make a break in the middle here, and then um, we are going to finish the test of uh, reRAMS part and then go into the compiler technology part. And yeah, and here it's about principles of compilers for machine learning, then the requirements for compilers in neuromorphic computing, the compiler flow, and some case studies that I, I brought to you. Um, so yeah, that's um, it for the introduction, uh, for the welcome and the organization. And I'm going to go into the introduction directly. And yeah, the presenter is working cool. <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing. OK. No, wrong direction. That's it. OK, so let's start with the, with the introduction. And um, as I said, well, what are the learnings for the session? What are you going to, to learn today, hopefully? So first, um, you're going to have some idea of what is neuromorphic computing, because I think it's a very vague term where, where many people understand slightly different things um, from this. So I hope that um, you get some idea what we um, think of, of neuromorphic computing and how we define it. Um, then we want to discuss why neuromorphic computing can um, solve today's challenges. So as you saw in the uh, introduction slide at the beginning, there's this huge um, promise of, of much improved uh, efficiency. So I hope you can understand how this can be achieved with neuromorphic computing. Then since this is a talk from technologies all the way up to software, um, we're going to give a short introduction on what technologies enable neuromorphic computing while you get a deeper introduction in the second part on testing um, on, on the technology stack and then de derive the core challenges for neuromorphic computing for that. Okay, so let's start with the definition of neuromorphic computing. And if we just start thinking about the term neuromorphic, it is something like brain inspired, right? It's, it's a very, very vague term where you can understand very different things from. And um, I want to give you some idea of, of what kind of different technologies you can find in this uh, space. Also, Intel, for instance, has, I think, a relatively large um, uh, group on neuromorphic computing with the LiOE chip. So um, I'm going to try to give you an overview of what are the different available technologies here. And in general, um, as you probably can already imagine, neuromorphic or brain-inspired computing is mainly about machine learning because um, our brain is very efficient in terms of uh, doing um, pattern recognition. So they claim like that our brain approximately consumes 20 watts of energy and you can all do all this nice online learning in your brain and you can easily learn a new language. And that's very different to what you can see in today's computer systems where you need lots of energy. For instance, if you take a look at the GPT-3 uh, model, I think it's uh, supposed to take multiple millions of dollars to just train this model in pure energy consumption. So that's like a huge difference to like training uh, language to, to a human, um, which is much more easy. So uh, machine learning is used in, in speech recognition, computer vision, image processing everywhere nowadays. And essentially how, how we are currently using, solving this problem from a, from a computer perspective is that we have very computation intensive workloads that needs a lot of data. So basically all these tasks are computation intensive and data intensive. And um, this, this leads to some limitations in, in terms of um, what we can do, especially in terms of power consumption. So um, all the computers we are today using are basically in the von Neumann architecture. And I think all of you know the von Neumann architecture. I'm going to explain it quickly anyways. So, so you have the separated CPU and main memory, which is connected via some interconnect like a bus. And then you also have some I.O. that is connected to the bus. And then in these kind of architectures, you always have to shove all your data and your program from the memory into the CPU and vice versa, right? So you always have to move your program and your, your, um, and your data, which is a very effective design since we are all using that for like um, conventional computing. But for machine learning, this is getting um, a critical problem here. And I'm going to show you some data on the slide as well to, to highlight this. So essentially, since this is such a data and computation intensive task, um, this, uh, the, the bandwidth of your, your interconnect and the bandwidth of your memory gets to one of the core limitations of these systems. And this is what we call like either the von Neumann bottleneck or the memory wall problem. You find different terms for that in literature. And just to write this uh, point home, I took some uh, picture here from a very nice 
paper just giving an overview, benchmarking different uh, deep learning accelerators. And then um, this is basically your roofline model here. And um, you can see the computational intensity on the x-axis and the performance you can get from the system on the y-axis. And then you'll see that in this like um, sloped part here, it's a, a computation limited. Um, your, your system is computation limited. And here in the, at the roof line, your system is memory bound. And as you can see, like the most operations are matrix matrix multiplications in your workload, like 85% of this ResNet 50 workload are matrix matrix multiplication. And most of them are, are memory bound. So um, I think the authors claim that these is only 10% of the operations and 90% of the operations are actually memory bound for ResNet 50. Um, and this is for a TPU, so basically a machine learning targeted architecture. So as you can see, this is a huge problem, and this is where neuromorphic computing tries to step in by, by saying, okay, we'll do brain-inspired computing to essentially solving this memory bottleneck, enabling all these cool new things that we want to do with um, computers like online training and uh, more effective machine learning. So yeah, these are the core uh, promises of neuromorphic computing that you will have reduced power consumption, again, inspired by what the brain can do, um, that it is able to, to do pattern uh, recognition at very low power budget. Um, they also discuss about uh, improved latency because, well, if you don't have to move your data um, as much because um, you're doing more like a brain-inspired computing thing, your, your latency will improve. And then also one huge promise is that we can finally enable online training in these systems. And um, for this, you'll find in this, like, as I said, the term neuromorphic computing is a very broad term. You'll find very different types of technologies that all are under this umbrella of neuromorphic computing. And I tried to list, it, list some here, also like order them from something that is actually market ready, you can buy until very basic research. And um, yeah, I, I think I'll not cover everything in these four bullet points, but in my opinion, these are the four most important bullet points at the moment. So on the market ready side, you'll find event-based processors like I think the Intel DOE chip is one of those, which essentially is like a little bit event-based processor, or the inner Terra um, chips for, for the optical flow um, camera chips are, are another example. So these kind of uh, processes, say they, they are neuromorphic because they are event-driven, because our brain also works with events. And so this is something you can buy. Then um, you'll also find a lot of different things on neuromorphic uh, computing with using computing and memory technology, again, because you can claim like our brain doesn't move data. It's like everything is done in memory. So this is again a neuromorphic thing. And actually this is going to be today's focus essentially, but on the like even more on the research side, you'll find topics like spiking neural networks where I, I ordered them here. This might be a little bit debatable, but um, I argue that Spiking neural networks are more on the research side currently because we haven't figured out how to do training effectively in, in these uh, neural networks in comparison to DNNs. And then if you talk to the physics department and you want to understand what the, they are doing in the lab, you will find a lot of different approaches mimicking plasticity of the brain with soft matter materials and very basic research stuff. And today, yeah, as I said, we are going to discuss computing memory technology because we believe that this is one of the technologies that is the closest to being market ready, but not already available as a product. And that hopefully gives you some idea on, on what we can do in the, in the future with these uh, systems. So yeah, as I said, today's focus, computing and memory sys, uh, technologies, and then building machine learning accelerators on top of this. <clears throat> okay, so far for the, for the very broad introduction, let's go into the basics of machine learning to understand um, what we actually have to do to build an effective machine learning accelerators, uh, accelerator. So I think most of you have already worked with machine learning. I, I just assume that because it's such a broad topic currently. And also most of you probably know this basic um, stuff, but I'll try to explain it again just to get everybody on board here. So um, the most basic operation in machine learning, if you just think about it from an algorithmic point of view, are metrics, metrics, multiplications. So it's a very fundamental linear algebra operation that you find like in machine learning, but also in signal processing and many other fields in scientific computing. So essentially, metrics, metrics multiplication is you have your metrics A, your metrics B, that uh, gives you your metric C, and then you calculate it with uh, three different for loops here. Um, and the, the core arithmetic operation is that you have to take your two input operands A and B here and uh, sum them up. So you multiply those two and sum them up, and then you have um, this in a, in a stacked uh, for loop. So this uh, essential operation here in the middle, this uh, summation is what you call a multiply accumulate operation or MAC. 
So um, this is what you will see a lot in the next slides, this term uh, MAC operation here. And then you can also see there are basically no data dependencies. So you can do some loop reordering for this. So it's a quite quite easy parallelizable operation. And this is also what we want to do. Um, for like some generic metrics metric operation, you have a total number of MACs is M times M times L. So depending on the size of your matrices, obviously, or in other words, if we simplify everything, it's approximately O of N to, to the power of three, right? Because you have three operations, uh, operands, and they are somewhat in the same um, order of magnitude as n. And then if we want to link this to machine learning, you will see that um, it's something you will find, for instance, uh, or you'll find in, in very many different uh, ways of doing machine learning. Like one example are here, 2D convolution. So if you do a 2D convolution, you always have an input feature map, which is like a 3D matrix or a tensor. And then you have multiple kernels um, here just neatly shown as the different colors if you wanted, for instance, do an image processing thing. And then you slide these uh, kernels over the input values. And um, after your convolution operation, you get the output. And essentially, it's like your output is something like the sum of your multiplications, kernel times input. So essentially, this is a matrix matrix operation at the core of it, right? And um, so if we understand this as um, yeah, a matrix matrix operation, just for one example here, you have your kernel weights as a matrix. So this is what is shown here in red. This is your kernel weights. And um, then you have your input feature map, which is your data that flow into the system. And this generates your output feature map. So your general, the, your, your basic operation here is a matrix matrix multiplication. And um, yeah, how does this work? During inference runs, your matrix A obviously is fixed, like your kernel weights don't change because you have a fixed algorithm, but your matrices B and C change over time because B is your um, input data, which change if you run multiple instances of your algorithm and obviously your output also changes. And this makes, so this essential operation is like 90% of popular convolutional neural networks, as you saw in the ResNet50 example at the beginning. And then you have different data flows for this. So the most uh, popular are weight stationary, input stationary, and output stationary data flows. So the question here is which of these matrices is kept in your lowest uh, level of hierarchy in your, in your memory hierarchy, um, closest to your multiply accumulate um, operation units. Um, so if you, for instance, keep your, uh, what is the first one, your matrix A stationary in your lowest, um, in your, in, in, in the lowest level of a catch hierarchy, this is what you call a weight stationary data flow because your weights are mainly kept stationary inside your system. And then in conventional um, uh, von Neumann based architectures, you have to select the best of these data flows to get the highest performance. And then your architecture in, in von Neumann principles basically looks like this. So what you will do is a single instruction multiple data architecture because um, well, the multiply accumulate operation is always the same operation, but you have multiple data on this. So essentially you have several lanes with independent ALUs, but getting the same instruction. So you can represent this as a, as a vector operation. And then if you want to further increase the throughput, you can just do like a multi-core setup of this. And um, at cost of area and power, obviously, if you want to just replicate the number of units that, that you have available. And this is the essential way how we do this um, today in terms of, um, yeah, in CPUs, in GPUs, in uh, digital, digital signal processors, but also in deep learning accelerators like the Google TPU or any other product you'll find on the market, there are plenty, right? So essentially what you can see here now again on, on the side is that you have multiple of these multiply accumulate um, ALUs here, that you have core memory where certain data are stored, and then you have like a level further, the the PE memory. So this is like one level up in your memory hierarchy here. Just for an example, we have input and output data in your PE memory and your filter or your weights in the core memory. So this is like representing a weight stationary um, idea here. And then essentially what you have to do is you have to do your matrix matrix multiplication on this kind of tensor processing unit. So um, yeah, you have this uh, for loop, this two for loops here for your multiply accumulate operation that generates this. And then if you go through um, these operations, what essentially is going to happen is um, you have spatial SMID lanes on the on the um, J for loop and temporal folding in the data dependency on the K for loop or visually it looks like this. So first you start here with the first operand, here with the first operand, and then you go to the second operand and the second operand here. But um, yeah, your units can just work on these uh, vectors um, independently. And then, yeah, you just iterate the for loop until you're done. 
So um, yeah, this is the basic way how to do this. And then in terms of SMID acceleration, so what do you get uh, in comparison to just a very simple, basic single core setup? So if your number n, so which represents the size of your matrices, is smaller than your SMID units, you basically can reduce your operation from n squared to n here. So your two four loops, you can just calculate them at once, right? So that's quite neat. And then um, what you will find in most architectures is probably, again, most people here are familiar with, um, for instance, in the Google Edge TPU, you can then do like a tiled multi-core architecture, which we call a systolic array, where you have all these different um, multiplier accumulate PEs here. And then um, basically this is a custom SMID pipeline with a certain number of operations per cycle. You need large on-chip memories, so you have to store all your activation, your instruction and your parameters locally and also in the DRAM and shove them in and out the whole time. So you have quite a complex buffer management and um, yeah, but anyway, so these PEs then can all in parallel do um, in a systolic style the matrix matrix multiplication. And usually, especially for edge um, devices, you have a low bit width. So if you take a look at this is for the edge TPU, it's only int 8. But if you do it um, on data center scale, it's obviously like floating point operations that you can also run here. Um, yeah, so in terms of system efficiency, so as I said, the maximum achievable throughput here is four teraops. Um, the maximum power is two watts, so it's like two teraops per watt. And um, this also gives you some idea why neuromorphic computing is such a huge promise, right? If you can get some two teraops per watt with uh, current systems at the market, getting over a thousand would be huge. And um, yeah, then I gave you some other numbers here in terms of the area, but I think that's that's not super relevant for today. So um, yeah, so what you can see, like this is the current state of the art design. And um, essentially, you still have to move all those data from your DRAM into the system and back. And this is one of the core bottlenecks here, as we saw in the first slide, where we have the, um, the way your system is basically memory bound at the top of your roofline plot. And um, to solve this, what or one of the technologies in neuromorphic computing, and this is the technology we are going to focus on today, is computing in memory. So essentially, building a system where you don't have to move your data from your main memory to this multiply accumulate units, but you want to combine those two um, units into one. And one technology for this that we are heavily researching at RWTH Aachen University is a resistive random access memory. Um, so some uh, abbreviations for this is either RRAM or REROM. So you'll find both in literature, but it's just the same. And um, Letizia is going to give a more detailed introduction on the technology in the next talk. But essentially, um, the memristor structure looks like this, that you have um, adjustable resistances in a, in a filament here. And um, so this is basically a non-volatile memory element. So you can adjust the resistance value here um, in, in, your, in your different, um, in your different uh, parts of the memristor. And um, yeah, so those are the two core principles here. You can change the, the, um, um, the resistance value of this device and it's non-volatile. So it keeps this value even if you power it off. And then usually it's um, integrated like this. So you have one top line here and one bottom line here, so where you connect it. And this is also what you find on this like um, structure. So this is the bottom line, this is the top line, and you can see you cross them. And then you basically have like an X structure here. And then in the middle, like in this part, this is basically the top down shot of this unit. And um, so what does these, or what do these devices promise? They do promise a very high um, device density because you can basically integrate this um, in, in a very small package here. And you can, in theory, store any value in this adjustable resistor, right? You can basically do like an analog value inside this um, resistor. In real life, it's not that good, but in, in theory, that's what is possible. Um, you have a very low power consumption. Again, this also relates to the this idea of having this non-volatile memory element, and you can do low latency operations because now you can use this uh, resistance value to do calculations. So before I'm going to show you how to do calculations quickly, how do we program this device? So essentially, <clears throat> the, your, your memristor has this hysteresis loop. So you have your um, your your um, um, you have a v on the x-axis and your current i on the y-axis, and then um, you can program it with like free, uh, pulses that you give into the system. And depending on the frequency of your pulses, you can adjust this this curve for your resistance value. And then um, so this basically, um, yeah gives you some way of programming the device. So this is what we would call programming the device. And then you can see I marked some image, uh, some lines here in red and some lines in blue. So essentially here we showed a low and a high resistive state, right? So in one state, um, you have a low resistive state and then the other state you have a high resistive, uh, vice versa, 
you have a low resistive and a high resistive. Uh, you have a low resistive and a high resistive state here. Um, so depending on what you program into your device, you get a different current uh, depending on the uh, on the voltage you get into the system. And this allows you to do some analog computing, right? So your your output current is basically the value you program into this times the input uh, uh, voltage you give it. And um, yeah, so, so how do we do this? So essentially we now have a programmable um, resistive device and then we can um, bring it into a crossbar-like structure. So this is something you will find in many computing and memory technologies that you build up these crossbar-like structures. So essentially you have a, word lines and bit lines here, and um, you have these um, memristors at the intersection between all of these lines, and you can now program some value in here, and then um, you can do some computing and memory operation for matrix vector multiplications by basically applying this um, this rule that if you have, um, that uh, your voltage here goes in, flows through your memristor here, um, is multiplied by your, your conductance value, and you get an output I here, and then you do this for V1, V2 until Vn, and then you sum up all these um, currents on, on, on the uh, horizontal line here. So essentially for each of these uh, ijs here, you get the sum of i equals one to n over the g value times the, the voltage value here. And um, this basically gives you a way of doing a computing and memory operation because you can store your weights of your um, of your um, algorithm in these memristors and then run the computation on the um, on this device. So that's the essential operation you do. Um, you have digital analog converters on the uh, left hand side. You put in the digital values um, you want to have as an input data. You have your your weights already stored in these devices. And then um, you get your, your output here at the bottom. And then you have to do a shift and hold, obviously, to basically store your values shortly. And then you do, again, an analog digital conversion back. And then with the shift and add, you get your complete matrix, matrix multiplication inside this um, device. And the advantage is, first, it's a non-volatile storage. So you can power it off and power it on. So that's really cool for IoT devices, for instance. That is like a huge promise of this technology. And the second thing is that your matrix vector multiplication is now basically done in O of 1, right? You can just do it once. You just put in the data, and you're done. And um, I put the slide here to, for your summary of this. So basically, what is the promise of new, for human and neuromorphic computing? So essentially, this is like your conventional CPU. You wouldn't really do this, but just for your comparison, where you only have one ALU, which is very slow. So you need um, a lot of operations to do this. Then you have your TPU-styled SMID um, or systolic arrays, where you can run multiple of these operations in parallel. And then you can already see that um, you improved uh, you improved in terms of, of your matrix mat vector performance here. How, how many um, operations you can do if you have sufficient compute nodes. So this is for if you have sufficient compute nodes, this is the general case. So you got from n squared to n here. And then if you use a rerun cross by essentially you can do it all in one. So this is this is the core way um, how we understand this as, a, as an improvement. In real life, obviously, it's not that easy. So this sounds very cool, but Many of you may already have an intuition that doing analog digital conversion and vice versa is quite costly and difficult and makes life complicated. And I think this is one of the core challenges of this technology. So in theory, analog computing is super efficient. And in the real world, it's super complicated, right? So this is like the huge gap that, that we have to solve here. And I just give you like a huge list here of different um, challenges that we have to solve. So for instance, there are sneak path currents. So um, this means that um, your current flows not only through one of the memristors, but through multiple of the memristors. So what you will find in literature, the state of the art design is basically one T, one R. So you add a transistor here next to your resistance value. So this is one T, one R, just that you know that this term is what you do. If you read it in literature, this reduces your sneak path currents. Then you have very large um, cell to cell and device to device variability. So this makes it quite challenging in programming it. So you can't just put in any analog value and reliably get it back. So essentially what uh, current technology that you can buy on the market does, it reduces the, the number of bits you can store per cell. So three to four is what you can currently achieve. Um, then you have parasitics and the sensing range. So you can't do like super huge crossbars easily. You are still limited in the size of the crossbars. This is a huge challenge. Um, then the ADCs, they are very expensive. So you have to do either a shared ADC design or do some custom sense logic here, because um, this is one of the core issues at the moment that while your matrix vector multiplication and analog is now super efficient, 
you have this rather inefficient conversion into the digital domain back. So you have to do some, some um, challenging um, designs here. And also it's basically nonlinear operation. So it's getting, it's getting very challenging. And this uh, paper, one et al., this is the one that I showed at the beginning from Nature with the very high uh, efficiency. I really recommend it to read it if you're interested in all the details. They show this relatively nicely. And the, one of the figures and explain these challenges like four, uh, four, five is somewhere, here's five, six, seven, these are the core challenges and how they resolve them in a technology level. So just for your reference, I think this is a very well-written paper and very worth reading. And um, yeah, so if we now have this unit and just assume it is, we can build this. Um, so then we have to integrate it into a digital system. So now we scale this up hierarchically to a system. And um, the, the architecture template for these computer memory cores always looks essentially like this. Um, I, it's basically from different papers. I wrote the, the core elements here together. So you can see that the heart of it is this um, crossbar array with uh, the digital and analog. Uh, so in the analog domain here and digital components around it. And then you have a core controller and you have IO. And also sometimes you find a general purpose execution unit in these cores because you can't do any operations as a matrix vector operation, right? So essentially you have your, your rerun technology at the, at the heart of it then um, you get your analog um, matrix uh, vector arithmetic down here. Um, you can map the remaining operations into this general purpose execution register, and you scale it out to a multi-core system via bus interconnect. And essentially, your data flow digitally in via the bus interconnect, go to the data buffer, then are stored in the input registers, converted to the analog domain, run through your analog matrix vector multiplication, convert it back into the digital domain, and then put back to the data buffer here to, to further run it. So this is how you essentially do a metric sector operation. And then if you do need, for instance, run an activation function or something like that, you would do it in this general purpose thing. And um, how do you use it? Well, it's a two-phase um, uh, setup here. So first you have the setup phase where you write the weights of the neurons into these um, memristive devices. So this is only executed once if you run it as an inference machine. If you run it as a training machine, it looks different, right? But if you just run it as an inference machine, you one time write the weights into this, and then in the inference phase, you basically use it as a metric vector operator, and you have a weight stationary data flow. So only so your neurons are mapped statically to these units, and your input data flow through the system. And um, yeah, then if we want to scale it to a system architecture, I already told you, like, you have to do a multi-core setup, so you are somewhat limited in your core size here for each of these cells. So um, essentially, yeah, you, you um, have one of these um, SIM cores here interconnected to, for instance, an XE4 interconnect. Then you can uh, allocate multiple of these SIM cores to one interconnect with a local memory. And then this is what you in literature usually call a tile. And then you always have a system interconnect that connects all these tiles. And then connected to the system interconnect, you will find an I.O. like sensors or global memory. So basically, you always have this hierarchical architecture that abstracts away that our SIM cores are limited in terms of the, the size um, that the rerun crossbars can offer because of the, the limitations of the analog devices. So this is how you solve this. And then you have different ISAs or instruction set architectures depending on the abstraction level. So your SIM core has a different ISA usually as the tile level system here. So for programming this, and um, at the end of the day, now you need a very efficient inter and intercore, inter and intracore um, communication system. So that's a typo there. It's, um, yeah, but anyways, you need a, a very efficient communication system because now it's like a data flow accelerator, right? You have your neurons mapped statically to the SIM cores and your data flow through the system. And yeah, you'll find different, um, again, you'll find very different architectures, but essentially they all default to this abstract view of what, what people do, right? They always do this kind of hierarchical view. And I just want to give two examples for these system architectures. One is Puma, which is quite um, famous. I think it's from 2019, so rather recent. So here you have this multi-core setup, and each of these cores, um, well, this is just a view of an, a core, essentially. So you have a router here, so a network on chip interconnect, on a system interconnect. Then you have um, FIFOs to get in the, the data for your, 
for your activation, uh, for your, from the activation of the previous layer, and then you have a shared memory inside this um, inside this unit, and then you have these cores that that essentially run your matrix vector multiplication. So you have small crossbars in each of these cores, and then you have one shared memory that allocates all the resources between them. So this is your essential setup here, and then in a different design like Max Two, it's it's um, a little bit newer, but you again see the same design. So you have like um, you have like these uh, tiles here, which contains the memristors. So essentially, this is like in this design, your lowest level of abstraction, then you allocate them into PEs, and then you allocate the PEs into a processing element. It's the same principle of this hierarchical architecture. And now this makes two um, things, the, the, the difference between this architecture, and this is essentially that you can also have local interconnects between next uh, adjacent um, cores to have something like a systolic array style architecture in the in the rerun domain. But essentially it's the same. You have like a scaled out hierarchical design, but with uh, different system interconnects. So key elements, hierarchical digital design to abstract away the analog things, mostly network on chip interconnects or custom core level interconnects to solve that. This is now an interconnect problem that you have to solve. And then um, the next example that I already brought at the beginning is this uh, new run chip which is really nice for, for all the community working on neuromorphic computing because I think it's the most advanced, really manufactured computing and memory device. As I said, read the paper. So it's a, it's a very large design here, um, currently manufactured in 130 nanometer. Um, it's, uh, th their main innovation, in my understanding, is that they have very, very efficient digital analog converters. So this is one of the core contributions of these authors here. And um, they don't need a ADC sharing from this, so this makes your design very efficient. But anyway, still for the analog digital com, uh, conversion, if you read the paper, you will see that the, your sensing circuitry still dominates your, your power efficiency. So it's still a huge research issue how to get your analog data back into the digital domain. Um, but anyways, you can again see here, it's like this hierarchical design where you have, so this is like top down, but essentially you have your reruns at the lowest level and then you scale the system up. And so what is possible currently, so just like to wrap this whole thing up, so I compare this Neuron chip versus the Iris chip um, from Academia 2016, which uh, 17, which was uh, one of the like first um, TPU style uh, um, um, architectures from Academia, and then the Google Edge TPU just to have some example to compare it. So I found like comparing it versus a data center scale um, accelerator doesn't make sense currently because your um, your computing memory architecture still is limited in the bit width of your single cells. And then what you will see is um, you can scale up the bit precision here, and then you get different uh, energy efficiency. Obviously, your energy efficiency drops if you increase the bit precision, which is the same for the Google Edge TPU. And then you can see for this really manufactured chip with 130 nanometer node in the CMOS device, compared to the Google Edge TPU, which I think is a 22 nanometer node. I couldn't find reliable data on this. Maybe some of you have better ideas on this. But anyways, Google didn't publish this, but I think it's a 22 nanometer design. Um, so they get like two teraops per watt, and then they get seven here. So even though we are working in 130 nanometer CMOS design, we are already more efficient than what you can do with this. So this is, I think, quite impressive and shows that this technology can actually work. And I, I'm very convinced that we can make this market ready um, if we invest more like research effort into this, because this looks really, really promising. Okay, to sum this up, and yeah, I'm on time, that's good. <laughs> um, to sum this up, I, I gave these four questions at the beginning. So what are your key take home messages today? So um, the first question was, what is neuromorphic computing? And I basically give you an int introduction to that, that it's the path from this von Neumann computing architectures to computing and memory in, in our understanding, but there are different technologies that you can also bring in this umbrella of neuromorphic computing. Um, so why does the neuromorphic computing as seen as a computing memory device uh, solve today's challenges? So it would, in theory, remove the memory wall. Um, so this problem in von Neumann architectures that you have to get the data in and out of your compute cores and thus make um, very large power efficiency advantages. This is at least what is predicted from this technology. Um, what is the key technology that's enabled this? In our understanding, it's analog in memory computing. And um, we are opting for VRAM here as, as the core technology. 
And then what are the core challenges? So the one was building efficient systems. So this is what I tried to highlight in terms of system architecture, that if you have this hierarchical design, this is really relevant for build efficient systems, but we are not computer architects per se. We are more from the reliability and the programmability, like compiler design um, part. So uh, our next part is going to do two other challenges. First, building reliable systems. This is what Letizia is going to do next. And then in the final part, I'm going to discuss how to make these systems programmable from a software perspective. So that's the first part. Um, I'm open to some questions, um, and then Letizia can, can continue. So it's, it's okay? A few, two or three minutes of question if there are some. Uh, fire away, yeah. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, are we limited to the weight stationary flow using the RERAM flow? Yes. Or is it the most adopted one and we can switch between the no, weight? No, you can't switch. It's, that's one of the core limitations from a, like, as an AI accelerator guy, this is something that bugs me, right? right? You can't really do any other data flow because programming these devices is time intensive and very costly. So you really want to do the separation between setup and appearance phase. Um, be, and if you would not opt for a weight stationary data flow, you would have to do reprogramming the whole time, and then you'd lose all the advantages of the system. Okay, so a follow-up question to that. So for, uh, in future, it means we are mostly limited to the inference stage with this technology if we are following the weight stationary. Um, so the way I presented here, yes. <laughs> then other people will disagree on this. So I think that in general, if you would build a complete analog computer, and this is what I said with mimicking, mimicking plasticity on the research part, you can use these devices also to build complete analog training um, machines. Um, but yeah, I'm not an expert on this, and this is why I'm trying to not uh, tell you too much about it. <laughs> um, but in general, yes, there are researchers who try to build uh, training machines from this, and they claim that it is very efficient, because then rewriting, so like, Again, if you compare inference in a TPU versus inference in RERAM, then writing the device gets very costly because the inference phase is relatively efficient in the TPU. While on training, it's again very inefficient to do training on GPUs per se, so then the, the issue of rewriting these devices is not that severe. Thank you. Hey, uh, this is Dr. Sao from IIT Roorkee. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. So first, First thing is uh, like uh, regarding data mapping, right? So uh, we can say that let's say it's uh, we have the nodes and we have the memory units which are connected close by. What if the data is not fitting uh, near the code? Then we don't have a order of one uh, evaluation, right? So yes. because we need to move around the data and that might cause the bottleneck and uh, you might not have the data, proper data inside. Correct. That's first question. And the second question is, could you please put some light on the ISA and uh, compiler aspect? I mean, what exactly is uh, going to the output of the compiler? Yeah. I do this in the yeah. third part and both answer both questions there. Okay, okay. <laughs> thanks. Hello, uh, why you are choosing only re RERAM? Uh, is there any possibility for other? Yeah, uh, there's possibility for other technologies. So we are experts on this because we come from like a university that has very good uh, manufacturing on this. Um, yes, there are different options. You can also do this in SRAM. You can do analog computing in SRAM. And um, there are also other technologies like uh, this, uh, what was it called? Cap RAM, STT RAM. So yes, we, we are focusing on RERAM just for the sake we are experts on this. You can plug in different technologies um, into these uh, devices as well. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> is there any issue in uh, converting data from ADC to DAC, which cost the time consumption? Like in, currently it's... Currently, you said that it's a memory wall, which like create an issue in the data flow. Yes. So uh, when we put EDC and DAC in between, so uh, doesn't that affect the data flow, which because yes. it takes time to convert? Yes. So uh, what is the effect of that? Yeah, it's, it's quite large, actually. This is one of the core research issues why I said, like, um, this is one of the challenges that we have to solve. So if we want to build efficient systems, um, this digital analog and vice versa conversion is one of the core challenges, and it is not yet so efficient and this is why these systems are not yet uh, on par with um, with uh, building a conventional for human system. So, do we have any comparison uh, currently? Uh, what is the if, uh, like effect of current uh, DAC and EDC performance with respect to the original memory wall 
Yes, so this is the this was the last slide. So the current state is that you get uh, seven teraops per watt for this um, eight bit uh, technology um, with the ADCs, and you get two teraops per watt for the Google Edge TPU. So essentially, it's like it's getting close. <laughs> so this is why we are optimistic that it will be solved at some point. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. Uh, just one question. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you observe conductance drift in your device? Yes. You do, yeah. but I'm not an expert on this. Maybe you are. <laughs> okay. And the selector you're using transistor rates are for Yes, also. correct. Okay. okay, so let's go to the next part. Thanks, Maurice. Okay, so good morning. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so we are going to talking about uh, today the main challenges related uh, to using these resistive runs and what you can do in order to have a reliable devices. Okay. Reliability. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Usually you have that. That's the reason why I have a job. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Maybe it's like that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the testing of the resistive events. Okay, I will start with a brief introduction and um, then we are going to address these um, main uh, manufacturing deviations and their impact on the behavior of these novel devices. We are going to talk about defects and fault models, what are the difference, main definitions, and so on. And then I, I'm going to summarize the state of the art, and I'm going to present one, uh, it's, uh, two techniques that we develop in my group uh, uh, to perform manufacturing uh, testing. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what is going to happen if you don't properly test these devices at time zero and um, how to facilitate the propagation of the spots, okay? Okay, so basically, as Moritz already mentioned, okay, um, um, we, um, the technology has evolved during the past, the past five decades, according to Moore's law, and um, the miniaturization of this transistor uh, makes possible the implementation of uh, high performance systems with uh, re uh, restricted constraints in terms of power, area, and performance. However, we observed uh, a limitation in terms of uh, transistor miniaturization. Okay, and this limitation um, uh, poses some significant challenges in terms of device technology. Okay, and the computer architecture. So basically, uh, Moritz already mentioned, we have these um, um, walls, okay? We have these device technology walls where reliability is the first one here, okay? Which means that the failure rate increase in lifetime, um, um, in the lifetime of this device is going to be reduced, okay? So you have with this miniaturization, um, this, um, uh, the, the, the number of possible faults and defects that can affect the device during manufacturing is increasing. So you have a less reliable device at time zero. You needed to be able to properly test these devices. And then you have a, another problem that during lifetime, we are going to face different reliability issues related to aging, related to susceptibility to environmental noise and so on. So you needed to deal with that. Basically, we have, I think that you all uh, already saw in some point, this bathtub that is the relation between the, um, the, the, the probability of failures during the beginning of the lifetime of the circuit that is really high, then you perform manufacturing testing, burning, and then you put the, the circuit in a, a constant uh, failure rate, and then during lifetime you are going to increase the failure rate again. So this is a really big issue when you think about the transistor miniaturization. Okay, then you have this leakage wall that's related to power consumption. The static power uh, became really important and relevant when you think about the total power consumption of the circuit. And the cost wall, of course, that's always a big issue. When you think about uh, 
um, computer architectures, um, uh, these uh, three walls. We have the memory wall that uh, Moritz already mentioned about power and the structural level parallelism wall. Basically, the, uh, the, these novel devices, the, the main advantage is that they are going to address this memory wall. We are going to eliminate this communication between the uh, um, processing units and the memory during the uh, operation. So, Basically, you have all this uh, scenario, and in this context, you have these novel devices that we call main restive devices or main restore, okay, where uh, they uh, represent a, a promising candidate to um, complement the CMOS technology, okay. So, in some um, papers, you are going to, uh, to read it that they are promising for replacing completely this CMOS technology. We, I don't uh, agree with that. I think that's a, a really um, powerful way to complement the CMOS technology in order to solve some problems, some walls related to device and computer architecture. But why they are so interesting? Basically, because from the perspective of technology, okay, they are um, um, they, they have this CMOS manufacturing process compatibility, which means that we can manufacture the CMOS technology and then in the back end of the line, you can manufacture these um, novel devices, these main risk devices, and then you can have the integration of both technologies. Okay, they also have this uh, zero standby power consumption and uh, high scalability in density. You can have a really high density memory elements or computation memory elements uh, using this uh, novel technology. Okay, and from the point of view of the architecture, we did what is the, the most interesting thing uh, of using this uh, main restive device is the fact that you can implement memory elements, but not only memory. You can use these uh, resistive runs at, uh, for performing uh, computation in memory, which means that you are going to have processing elements, okay, at the same uh, device. And this is these advantages make the implementation of emerging applications possible. Okay. However, we always have a problem. We the use of these novel devices uh, depends on being able to guarantee their quality after manufacturing, which means at time zero, and their reliability during lifetime. You needed to deal with that. You needed to understand how to test this device. Because today, if you think about CMOS technology, um, even planar or FinFET technology, after the manufacturing of each chip, you are going to perform manufacturing testing. Okay, And you have a cost related to that. You needed to some constraints when you are thinking about uh, how to test uh, these devices, okay? And then during lifetime, you needed to find a way to estimate the lifetime to understand, for example, how to uh, minimize the aging impact of these devices. We needed to understand uh, during lifetime how to do that. But the first point is after manufacturing, what you have to do, okay? What is the difference between testing these novel devices and testing CMOS or uh, classic uh, planar or FinFET technology? So, but for being able to properly test these devices, first of all, you needed to understand what are the main reliability uh, issues sources, okay? We have uh, some um, sources of these reliability uh, uh, concerns, okay? And you needed to analyze into the separate uh, phases, okay? First of all, if you observe this graph, it's possible to see here that we have a type zero, which means that that is after manufacturing of these devices. So what can affect the reliability of these devices after manufacturing? What you have? We have these manufacturing deviations, okay, that can be uh, divided into main uh, uh, um, categories. Basically, we can have uh, during the manufacturing process of this device of CMOS as well, Okay, we can have some defects, which means that during the manufacturing process, you have deviations and they are going to introduce some defect. And then you can also have a process variation that has another aspect. Process variation can be divided into uh, different into categories again. We have what you call as tolerated process variation, which means that we can tolerate because this variability is not going to change the functionality of the device. This variability is just going to 
impacted the performance of this device. And that's the reason why you have several corners for each technology node. You have these corners, we evaluate, we design something, we evaluated the design in the in design phase just to understand it, that depending on the process variation, you are going to have an impact on our device. Uh, but you have a, a kind of extreme variability where um, in that case, we are going to have devices that are not going to work as we expected. Okay, and then defects that can be classified in easy to def detect the fact of faults and um, that can cause easy to detect faults and hard to detect faults. We are going to talk a little bit more about that when I'm going to present the definitions and um, related to defects in fault models. Okay. But when you think about it, um, the lifetime, when you think about time um, in, which means that during the lifetime. So basically we can have uh, some time dependent deviations and these deviations can be divided into types. So you can have the device, it can be uh, susceptible to environmental noise. And in that case, you are going to have uh, what you call as transient faults. Okay, you can have in memory elements um, single event upsets or multiple bit upsets, which mean bit flips, okay? That are transient, they are not uh, permanent faults because depending on the environmental noise, you are going to have uh, the propagation of these faults. You can have uh, these faults and the, your system still can work it properly. Imagine if you have, for example, in a memory element, you have a bit flip. If you don't use this and you write again in the same position, you are not going to observe any propagation of this fault. This is a silent fault in the system. So you can tolerate it, depending on the application, you can tolerate different levels of bit flips. Okay, you just needed to understand what is that level. But basically, environmental noise and opera uh, operational variations can cause these transient faults, okay? And also you have these temporal variations that's related to aging, which means that the device is going to age during lifetime, and the, the, the level of aging depends on several uh, aspects. Uh, for example, for FinFET technology or CMOS technology, you are going to have uh, these equations that you can model, and depending on the workload that you have, a voltage, you can estimate the lifetime of your circuit. Okay, so basically it's a temporal variation. Uh, the main source is BTI, bias temperature stability, that can be positive or negative and affect the PMOS or any MOS transistors. But the point is that during lifetime, your device is going to age and you are going at the end of lifetime to have permanent faults. Okay, the device is going to stop to work. And that's the main point. So you needed to address, you needed to understand these reliability issues sources. Okay, in order to properly derive some strategy to mitigate or to detect these deviations and in lifetime maybe to tolerate this, the occurrence of different kinds of faults. So, however, in this talk today, we, I'm going to, um, uh, to address the uh, reliability issue at time zero, which means that I'm going to concentrate my talk uh, showing how to properly test this device. Because one important point is that if you have test scapes here, okay, if you are not able to properly test this device at, the, at time zero, we are going to have some issues when we are uh, during lifetime, okay? The, the, the test scapes can, um, uh, can affect the reliability of the device. So what you have to do in order to deal with the reliability issues at time zero. So basically what you need is, we need to be able to develop efficient manufacturing test strategies, okay? But for doing that, okay, we can think, okay, up to date, what, uh, what you did, okay, what you have. The point is that we saw that these strategies that are used to test the CMOS-based circuits, they are not uh, um, uh, efficient to test this novel device. I'm going to uh, discuss with you in the, the next slides why, because basically we have different fault models, we have different fault behaviors that it can affect this device, and consequently I need new test strategies. 
Okay, so but the point is why is so difficult because you needed to have accurate fault models. Okay, and uh, because usually when you develop a test strategy, a manufacturing test strategy, you needed to have these fault models. Then you are going to develop the strategy and validate. But for having these accurate fault models, we need uh, to understand the manufacturing deviations that can happen when you are manufacturing these main resistive devices. And you needed to be able to map this using a realistic defect injection scheme and then derive the accurate fault models. Okay, so basically the point is that we don't really know what are the manufacturing deviations that can affect these devices. Okay, basically we have, as Moritz already mentioned, at Aachen you have a strong um, research groups that work on the developed manufacturing of these devices, but we don't have a high volume production of this device. We have a, a, a way to manufacture, to understand, to characterize, to, but we don't have a high volume production. And today you have like a, a couple of companies that can manufacture resistive runs. Uh, for example, we work with the uh, NXP that use the ATSNC uh, circuit. But the point is that um, they are not going to say, to, to, to give information about what is not really working. Okay, so this is one of the key challenges uh, for uh, people that usually work on testing reliability. Okay, we Everybody knows that something is wrong, that they have problems, but of course that the company is not going to say, okay, I have this problem, so solve to me. They are not going to, to give this information. So you have a lack of information regarding the possible uh, manufacturing deviations, the possible defects, what the default models. Okay, we have an idea, we can evaluate, we can manufacture and try to understand, okay? But we don't have a realistic way to uh, injected effects to, uh, to to have a great fault model. So here in this figure, it's possible to see this relation. So at physical level, you are going to have several defects that can be introduced during the manufacturing process. And these defects um, has to be translated at the logical or electrical level to a fault model, to a fault. So you are going to have a misbehavior and then you are going to classify this misbehavior as a fault, okay? And then, uh, um, you need basically on this knowledge and the possible defects, you need to be able to derive this um, defect injection schemes because this is the way that you are going during your simulation, your electrical simulation, you are going to model these defects and then simulate and then propagate the fault models. So basically it's that the main, the main challenge. <clears throat> so, Let's talk a little bit, and here is, uh, there are a couple of slides related to background. Let's talk a little bit more about these main resistive devices. So basically they were proposed in the 70s by Leon Shua, okay? Um, and the idea is that a main restore, this is the representation of a main restore that you usually use, okay? Uh, is a passive element that can be described by the time integral of the current through the time integral of the voltage across its two terminals. Okay, so basically this is the definition of a main resistive device. Uh, as you can see, it's a um, relatively old device. It was proposed in theory, okay, and uh, then uh, they just uh, forgot this device and now they started to work uh, using this uh, main resistive device again. So what you can do with that? Okay, so this is the curve the, the IV curve of a, a main resistive device. So basically this main resistive device or main restore has at least two distinct states, okay? We can have a high resistance state or a low resistance state. When you have a high resistance state, you are going to have a small current that flows through the device, which means that you are going to have a zero logic. And when you have a low resistance state on the device, you are going to have a high current and consequently you are going to have a one logic in the device. Why I say that we have at least two distinct states? Because you can use these uh, devices as a binary device, okay, as a transistor, as zero one, but you can also have the possibility to use this device as an analog device. And this analog device can have multiple states as well, 
Okay, we have some uh, workers in literature where you can have like seven states or something like that. The problem again with this is the reliability in terms of um, um, noisy of this uh, signal, integrity of these uh, signals. Okay, because it basically you are going to have a really small margin between these states, and uh, maybe you are if you have some kind of noise, you are going you are not going to be able to distinguish it between the seven levels. Okay. Uh, in theory, it's possible, but um, uh, the point is that you have this integrity problem with these several states. So, uh, so how uh, the device switches between high resistance state and low resistance state? Basically, we have to apply a voltage, okay, a specific voltage for set, and a specific uh, set for from high resistance state to low resistance state. We are going to have the set operation, and for low resistance state to uh, high resistance state, you are going to have a reset operation. So we are uh, we are going to apply this voltage, and then you are going to have the set. Here is the own state, okay, is the current that flows when you have a, uh, the own state. And then you apply again another voltage that usually, so you are going to apply a positive and negative voltage. And then you are going to have a reset in the off state, okay. Um, so that's the main uh, behavior of this device. You apply a specific volt voltage for a set a specific voltage for reset, and then you switch the device from the two states, okay? And if you wanted to read the device, you are going to apply a really small voltage because otherwise you are going to, instead of read, you are going to switch the device, okay? So usually we have for the devices that you use a voltage for set and reset around 1.5 volts or something like that. And the read voltage is like 0.4 or 0.5, okay? Uh, uh, so in that way, you are going, you are not going to disturb the device. So there are a lot of different kind of flavors of these main wisdom devices, okay? They can be classified initially as ionic ethane film and molecular main resource or magnetic and spin-based main resource. This is for the STTM runs, magnetic runs, okay? So you have this spin transistor, so you can also use this novel technology. We are going to um, look at this specific kind of main wisdom device, okay? And this kind of main resistive device is used to implement these resistive random access memories, these reruns uh, that you, we are going to talk today, okay? Uh, again, when you think about uh, this specific type of main resistor that you use to implement the resistive reruns, we can classify these uh, devices, we can further classify these devices according to the switching mode, conductance mechanism, switching mechanism. So basically, we can have uh, the switching mode, you can have uh, unipolar or bipolar, okay? We use uh, bipolar devices. Uh, you can classify according to the conductance mechanisms. Here you can see the bottom electrode, the topping electrode, and you can have this conducted filament or area dependent device. We use at the you, you you have both, okay? But in this research, we are um, using conducted filament based main resistor device, which means that for um, have uh, switched the, for switching the device or for having uh, operation between setting reset. Uh, we are going to apply the voltage and then you are going to have the formation of the conducted filament uh, and the, in the opposite side, you are going to have the rupture of the conducted filament. So this is the basic idea of the device. And you can uh, classify according to the switching mechanisms and you are going to talk about the valence changing mechanisms. Okay, so from now on, you, when you talk about the main resistive devices, we are going to address bipolar, filamentary, VCM-based resistive events. That's the kind of memory that you are going to work with, okay? Um, so, some concepts, basic concepts that you can, uh, I just to put uh, you all on the same page, okay? What is a defect, okay? A defect is an electronic system is an unintended difference between the implemented hardware as intended design, this is one definition, or it's a flaw 
or physical imperfection that may lead it to a fault. So here it's possible to see some defects. Here I have an open, for example, I don't have the material. And here I have an extra deposition of the material. So this could be like a resistive, um, a resistive bridge defect or something like that. OK, so the defects, the cause of the defects process defects that we are going to talk here, which means that we during the manufacturing process, you can have some missing contact, the windows, ox, oxide breakdown and so on. You have some material defects when you are applying all this process to manufacture and you have age defects that I already mentioned. So a defect is a physical thing that happen when you are manufacturing something or when you are using, you have some device that's broken. So this is, again, as a physical deviation in your uh, defect. You have a, uh, a fault that's a representation of a defect at a bestrate the functional level. So this defect can be there and you can uh, you, maybe you are going to have some kind of fault. OK, or this effect can be there and maybe you are not going to observe any fault behavior at logic level. OK, usually, depending on the size of the fact, you have this magnitude of the defect, for example, depending on the size of the fact, you can have a, like a um, parametric fault, which means that you don't observe any functional misbehavior. If you have a logic gate, you are going to observe the, 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 the correct behavior at the output, but you have some kind of parametric deviations, which mean you have like a, a bigger current consumption or something like that, electrical deviation. And this can be the indication of some problem uh, related to lifetime, for example. Okay, so you have a parametric, you don't have a functional, but you have a parametric fault. Okay, and when the um, this fault is propagated at the, and you are going to use this wrong information, okay, you are going to observe an error, okay, which means that a wrong output signal produced by a defect is called an error, okay. So. Uh, recently in this paper, okay, uh, it was proposed a, a new classification, new definition of a fault specifically for main resistive devices, okay. So uh, basically here it's, uh, yeah, it's any deviation from the expected behavior due to process variation, manufacturing defects, or design industry anomalies, okay. And the fault size here can be um, uh, categorizing three different cl uh, classes. Basically, a fault can be catastrophic depending on the, the deviation, okay? If the deviation is higher than the toler uh, tolerance limit, you are going to have a catastrophic fault. If the deviation only degrades the performance, okay, you are going to have a performance degrade, but it's still tolerated, it's not catastrophic, it's not going to affect the functionality, at least at time zero, maybe can affect and uh, the devices are going to be age faster than, than the nominal ones, okay, but it's not uh, catastrophic, which means that it's parametric. And if the deviation is insignificant, the, call, the fault is called benign, okay, so you can also have this situation, okay. And uh, uh, to conclude this part related to some, uh, some uh, concepts and definitions, uh, so what is a defect injection scheme? So basically, when you are uh, working on testing reliability, you, as I mentioned, you needed to understand what are the possible fault behaviors. But for understanding that, you needed to analyze the manufacturing process, but to understand the manufacturing deviations, but then you needed to find a way to model these defects when you are designing something. You needed to find a way, uh, depending on the level of abstraction, usually we start at a lower level, which means at device level, you needed to find a way to inject the defects, and then to simulate and observe what's the fault behavior, okay? In literature, you have two ways, two main ways to inject defects. You have this resistive defect model and you have the fact oriented model. Um, for CMOS technology, uh, uh, most of the time you use a resistive defect, which means that you are going to model these uh, defects yeah, including some resistors at the electrical level, okay? Here it's possible to see, for example, for a thin fatty acid cell, 
uh, all the points that we can inject the different kind of defects. So you have some resistive bridge and resistive open defects that you are model here, okay? And depending on the, the position, you are going to have a propagation of different fault behaviors. And of course, it's not only depending on the position, it depends also of the size of the fact. Okay, so for each defect, we can extrapolate, you can simulate different size of defects, and then you can, you can start with a small defect, and maybe you are not going to observe any fault. But then when you increase the size of the fact, you can observe some dynamic faults at the beginning and then some static faults. Okay. And the defect oriented model that is based on the idea of changing some electrical parameters of the device. So when you are simulating this novel device, you have the description, you have the model of the main visible devices, and you can uh, identify some electrical parameters and then change these parameters uh, to a margin that is uh, not in the nominal margin of the device, and then you are going to observe also fault behavior. So these are the main two ways to inject the defects when you are thinking about the main visitive device. Okay, and here is the representation of one um, yeah. way to inject the defects using resist, uh, resistors, uh, but you also work uh, with these novel devices uh, just uh, changing some electrical parameters of the, the, the model. Okay, so as I mentioned, we needed to understand the manufacturing deviations to have more accurate fault models, because otherwise you cannot really um, propose the efficient manufacturing test procedures. So a couple uh, in 2021, we started we published this, this work where the main idea was to analyze the manufacturing process of CMOS technology and then try to establish a relate to compare with the, the main research device manufacturing process, try to understand what are the possible deviations that can happen and, uh, have, and have some insights of what is the best way to inject the defects, what is the more accurate fault model, okay? So basically, before, uh, what you did here, we analyzed this, all this uh, manufacturing CMOS-based integrated circuits manufacturing process. And uh, we saw that, for example, we have here basically the process is divided in two main phases from the end of the line and back end of the line. Okay. Uh, for these two steps, as I think that you know, um, we are going to have, uh, for example, we start with the wafer preparation. And then you can have a photolithography, etching, doping, material deposition, planarization, and all these steps are going to be repeated until you have the entire system manufactured. Yeah? So um, just to understand, for example, if you uh, take into consideration doping here, okay, depending, we can uh, perform, you can perform this step uh, using different strategies and different uh, um, equipment, okay? So what I'm mean, uh, talking about uh, that, or what I mentioned that, because, if, for example, at Yuli, at Aachen, we have in these groups that are able to manufacture make this device, they use a specific uh, strategy, specific process. We can have a different process, okay? So the analysis was made based on the, what you have, what you do that there, okay? So when you think about material deposition, again, you can have a different kind of depositions. You can have a chemical vapor deposition or physical vapor and so on, okay? You can apply different process for different steps of the manufacturing process. Uh, just to understand that the main risk of device is usually is manufactured at the back end of the line, okay? So after when you have manufactured the CMOS technology, then you are going to manufacture the main risk of device on the top of the wafer. So uh, this is the uh, main risk of the device that you are considering here, okay, that you are analyzing in terms of manufacturing process step by step. So uh, the main goal is to create a device composed of bottom electrode and the topping electrode, and in the middle we have the scapping layer and the transition metal uh, oxide, okay, this TMO here. Uh, and so here is uh, just an image of this structure. Okay, so now the idea is to have a look at the manufacturing process of this device, okay, and try to understand what are the possible deviations and the misbehaviors that you can have depending on the variability of the process. So this is the 
flow of the manufacturing process of these uh, resistive runs, of these main resistive devices. So we start with substrate, okay, so then you have uh, this deposition of the bottom electrode, then you have a patterning, then you have etching, then you have this uh, TMO deposition of this material, then you have the cap and layer deposition, and then you have the here the uh, top electrode deposition, okay, and then you are going topping electrode patterning and the etching of these structures, okay. So this is the flow that we adopt at Udihi, okay. It's a um, realistic flow, okay. Of course, that you can adopt different materials for the for the electrode or for the this TMO part, okay. Um, but um, the idea is was to to understand so for each manufacturing uh, process step the possible process that we can adopt. For example, here you can adopt for etching reactive ion beam etching or reactive ion etching, and so you have different kind of sub processes. Okay, and the idea was basically on the, the, this is the these steps what you can identify. Just one comment. This kind of devices, okay, so after manufacturing, this is the physical process of the manufacturing process. And after the manufacturing, all these devices are going to be, um, are going to, to, to be uh, su subject of the forming step, okay? Which means that after manufacturing the devices, I need to perform the forming step. What is that? Okay, as I mentioned in my previous slide, these devices are the conducted filament-based device. Okay, so when you manufacture the devices, the device does not. Uh, uh, we don't have this conducted filament. Okay, so you need to apply a really high voltage. So it's a first set operation. It's like the initialization of this kind, these novel devices. So you need to apply a really high voltage. Okay, sometimes several pulses of this really high voltage just to perform the first set operation, and in that way, you are going to create this conducted filament. Okay, and the quality of this device also depends on the way that you perform this forming step. Okay, when you, ha uh, when you get a memory, okay, uh, that was manufacturing using linguistic devices, the devices are already formed. Okay, so you're uh, at the factory, they already applied this initialization. Okay, uh, so there are some works where you can find the relation between the quality of this forming step and the quality of the device and what you can observe after manufacturing. Okay, but in this work, the idea was not to, uh, uh, was not to go uh, to, to address this forming step. The idea was just to analyze this steps, physical steps, and try to understand the, 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 the possible deviations. So what you have here? So here you have this big table, okay, that starts here and continue in the next slide. So for these steps here, okay, we can have the manufacturing process step and the possible defects that can affect and the possible for defective or faulty uh, behaviors. For example, during the deposition, you can have uh, some problems related to the thickness, the variations in the thickness of the, the material. Okay, so you have the nominal value. Of course, that can uh, the people that are working on the manufacturing of the, these devices, they are they are trying different uh, thickness, they are trying different materials. Okay, but when you have uh, like a, a stable process, stable uh, device, we can tolerate some kind of variability. But you need to understand that this is a possible uh, defect that you can have. Okay, or you can have a poor or no bonding with contacts, contamination associated with the deposition process, and so on. You can have po several possible defects or deviations, uh, manufacturing deviations. And uh, when you think about uh, these possible defects, what can happen in terms of fault behavior? What can happen in terms of what will be the behavior of this device? Okay, we can have increased the contact line resistance. We can have, for example, this can affect the quality of the forming process, okay, if you have a really thinner or thicker uh, uh, bottom electrode. We can have a lower or higher heat conductance, okay, so you can have different 
uh, fault behaviors associated to each uh, physical deviation here. When you continue the analysis, for example, for the next step of the process variation, again, you can have, for example, if you think about uh, top electrode patterning, you can have the contamination by resi residual polymer. Or polymer. This is going to increase the contact and resistance of the device and so on. So these were the analysis that you did it based on the manufacturing process that you have at the uh, Aachen. Okay? And these are the possible misbehaviors. So resuming all this work, what you can observe is these five kind of misbehaviors. You can have increased or decreased the resistance of the contact and lines, lower reading conductance, lower quality or ineffective forming step, okay? Because you can have some defects that can affect the initialization of the device. So you are, the device is not going to set and then you have a fault device. You can have increased the bottom electrode oxide interface oxygen vacancy concentration. This is another point because the vacancy concentration of the device is going to um, represent the resistive state that you have. It's going to influence the current that flows on the device. Okay, You can have changes in oxy uh, oxy uh, oxygen vacancy concentration and so on. So basically, uh, we have these five misbehaviors that were identified uh, during our study. So uh, these defective devices, one point that they can cause what we uh, classify as easy to detect faults, which means what's the easy to detect fault? Is easy to detect fault is like um, a fault that you can uh, identify at time zero, just performing some kind of operation. Okay, if you test your device, if you need to have a memory element, for example, if you apply, if you write a one and you are able to read a one, if you apply or a zero, you are able to read a zero and so on. Okay, you are going to observe that the functional behavior of the memory is correct. But if you write a one and you are going to read a zero, for example, okay, which means that you have some problem, have some defect, and you are going to have a fault in that case. So this is a easy to detect fault. It's a static fault that can be easily detected when you apply some sequences of uh, uh, stimulus or uh, stimuli. Okay, but the point is that some defects are not going to cause this easy to detect faults. Some defects can cause what you classify as hard to detect faults because they are going to cause just a parametric deviation. Here you have an example. For example, um, if you have a lower quality or ineffective forming step, the device may remain in high resistance state, okay? Uh, which can be classified as stuck at fault. It's the classic fault model that is applied for CMOS. A couple of decades ago, when you wanted to test something, you just needed to consider stuck at faults. And you are going to cover like 95, 96% of the possible faults. With the miniaturization, we saw a different behavior because you are going to observe, for example, for SC runs, uh, thin fat based SC runs, that you have a lot of different kind of faults. You have a defective, the, the um, incorrect with the fault, the transition fault, different fault behaviors. So stuck, to test something for stuckat is not enough anymore. You needed to consider the other faults as well. Okay, so in that case, we can also have the possibility that the device may switch from high resistance to low resistance state. And then if it, that's the behavior, we are going to have a stuck at fault again, but the device can also remain in an undefined state. Okay, because you have this threshold for setting what's one and what's zero here as well. Okay, but the device can remain in this undefined range. And when you have that, you are not going to have a zero over one. You are going to have an undefined state. And this is a parametric fault. And this is not an easy to detect fault. This is a hard to detect fault. So you needed to find a way to properly test this device. Okay. Okay, so um, just, just... Can we take a quick break? Uh, yeah, yeah you can do. Yeah, yeah, you can do. Okay, so uh, now you have a break and then you can continue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So yeah, we'll have a 15 minutes break and tea and coffee there on the left hand side and right hand side.
<laughs> Folks standing outside, can you please come in? Maybe we'll get started. Yeah. Okay, so um, just to give an example, okay, what we did, what you think about the lower quality or ineffective forming step. So we performed some simulations just to understand the impact of this uh, misbehavior on the functional behavior of the device. So we use it as a case study at RIPRT resistive run with peripheral circuit. It was implemented in 113 nanometer uh, PTM technology. And uh, we uh, used this model that's available here that was developed at Aachen. And uh, we used this model for modeling main resistive devices, okay? And then the idea was to analyze what happens if you have a lower quality or, or if we don't have a forming a proper uh, forming step. Okay, what is going to happen with the conducted filament? So what you did? Uh, so here in this graph, you simulated. We changed it in the mo in the model. We have uh, two main parameters that represent the conducted filament of the the, the main the device. One of them is the length of the conducted filament. The other one is the <coughs> radius of the conducted filament. So we changed uh, these two parameters and try to understand the impact on the functional behavior. Okay. So here is the. Uh, L that the length of the conductive filament, the nominal value is 0.4 nanometer. Okay, and then you change the, this value, and we try to understand the resistance state after performing a, uh, a, a, a right operation. Okay, so here it's possible to see, okay, that it, uh, from 1.6 kilo ohms to uh, 100 kilo ohms. Okay, when the uh, LED assumes a value higher than 0.6, uh, the main resistor is not uh, going to switch anymore. Okay, so here you have uh, on this value here, okay, uh, higher than 0.6, and then you are going to have this undefined state if you uh, put the, the, the uh, length of the filament on this value, you are going to observe this undefined state, and then you are not able to switch anymore. The device. So, which means that the length of the filament can impact the functionality of the device. So, if you have an effective or lower quality um, forming step, you are going to observe this. And here it's possible to see for the radius of the filament again, okay, for a, 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 this um, parameter needs to be larger than 20 nanometer to guarantee the correct execution of a write one operation. Otherwise, you are going to remain logic zero. Okay, so here it's possible to see that if you don't have this value, you are going to remain in high resistance state. Okay, and here is the undefined state uh, range. So, Resuming all this discussion about uh, what is a possible fault behavior of uh, resistive runs. The first is, uh, possible fault behavior is the cell is not able to correctly switch during the set and reset operation time, okay? Because basically you have this pulse, you, have a, a, you can uh, pro, um, program the time that you are going to apply, and may, you can have uh, some fault behaviors where you cannot properly switch. So this is going to impact the device, uh, the, the device functionality. So this kind of uh, fault behavior is going to be classified as easy to detect fault, Okay, since the, the default behavior will be propagated at logic level. Okay, this is really easy to detect. Okay, this is we can just apply um, even a CMOS based the manufacturing test procedure you are going to detect. And then you have these two fault behaviors, parametric deviations that are going to impact the cell's performance and random misbehaviors being observed in some occasions. These two fault behaviors are really tricky, okay? Because here we are going to have a parametric deviations and if you are going to use a kind of manufacturing tests that are not going to look at parametric faults you and just at the logic level faults, okay, you are not going to be detected this. And this is a really problem in terms of performance in terms of reliability during lifetime. In this random misbehavior, this is a really big challenge here because you observe that a lot of random um, uh, faults. 
and you have a, a, a kind of fall that's intermittent, which means that sometimes you are going to observe and sometimes you are not going to observe. Okay, so how to guarantee that at time is zero, your manufacturing test procedure is able to detect this random misbehavior that you cannot uh, find a proper way to propagate this random, this is a random behavior. Okay, so this is really a challenge. And these two fault behaviors are going to be classified as hard to detect faults because they don't impact the device's functionality and they are going to cause parametric deviations. We, and this is really uh, difficult. This is the main challenge here when you think about how to test this device. Okay, so basically resuming, we have today two uh, fault models for resistive reruns. We are going to have the conventional fault model that includes all faults that are also observed in the CMOS based uh, memories and CMOS based circuits. Here we are going to talk about these fault models associated to the use of this device as a memory element. Okay, of course, if you think about the computation in memory, some logic, you can think about the new fault models. Okay, I'm going to, to concentrate on the use of this device as memory elements. So we are going to have these faults, stuck at fault, transition fault, coupling faults, write a disturbance, read the disturbance. For, okay, for all these definitions, you can check this reference. For example, if you have some doubt, I can explain. But basically, this is the conventional fault model for resistive reruns. But what is the main challenge here? This rerun unique fault model. Okay, you have new fault behaviors that were not observed in the CMOS-based technology. And here you have this undefined white fall, which means that here, if you think about this, uh, this graph, here you have, for example, the high resistance state, the low resistance state range. And then in, in between these two, you are going to have this undefined state range. And then when you have a lower, uh, uh, and you have a higher value here, you are going to have a extremely uh, low, uh, resistance state or extremely high resistance state. Okay, so this is the corrective behavior that you expect. And the defaults that you occur between these two states are the conventional ones because you can have, for example, a transition fault and it's just on this domain. And uh, but when you have the, 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 the value here for the uh, resistive state, you are going to have this unique faults. Okay, so the cell can be in this undefined state. It's not zero, it's not one, it's an undefined one. The cell can be in a deep state fault. Okay, the, resist the resistance of the cell is beyond the boundaries. Unknown read fault. Okay, this means that you, here you are going to have a random logic value. Okay, you are going to read it and after a set operation, after writer one, you are going to have sometimes a zero. After writer one, you're going to have sometimes a one as expected. It's a random behavior. I don't know what I'm going to read, okay? And then you have this new intermittent and defined state, okay? Where you have, a, um, what is the difference between trans tra transient and intermittent? Basically, transient can occur when you have some kind of environmental noise, and there is no uh, really a pattern for the propagation of, or for, the, 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 for causing this fault, okay? You are going to have like a transient behavior. Intermittent, you can um, observe the pattern. You can uh, understand, that, for example, if you observe a temperature like every time that my computer is uh, reaching, I don't know, 120 degrees, you are going to observe this fault. It's an intermittent behavior that you observe due to a specific condition. And you are always going to observe that behavior, okay? So these are the main uh, unique faults that you can have when you think about using these resistive events for memory elements. What you are doing today, okay? Uh, so you did this uh, all this work uh, uh, where you published this relation, and today we are performing failure mechanism analysis. You are performing inspection of this this circuits. We manufactured this uh, CMOS transistor, and the idea is to manufacture a main resistor on the top and analyze step by step the process in order to try to uh, derive a realistic defect injection scheme, accurate fault models, and consequently more efficient test procedures. Okay, we are also um, um, uh, using these chips that you developed 
for a process variation analysis. We wanted to understand what is tolerated in terms of performance in order to be able to have like a corner for this technology. So you have the typical behavior and the worst case, best case. And then what is not tolerated, what faults you can observe. Okay, so at the moment you are performing inspection of this. The idea is to have one main restore for each single chip and then you can perform all this analysis and uh, vis uh, visual analysis and also electrical uh, analysis. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about testing, okay? Uh, just uh, to understand the concept, uh, the concept of test is really easy to understand, okay? We are going to have like a circuit and the stats, we are going to provide some inputs, we are going to have an output, then you have the expected, the golden reference in terms of testing. You are going to compare and you are going to classify good and false circuit. That's the main idea of testing something, okay? Um, we can have a different kind of tests in categories of testing, okay? We can have a characterization, manufacturing, burning, income inspection. Basically, characterization is that a step when you are designing something new. All these guys that are able to manufacture this main restive device, what do they uh, do? They basically manufacture one device and they are going to extract the electrical parameter. They're going to characterize the device. So this is to understand the impact of a process, material, and deviation, and so on. This is a characterization that we are going to do during the design phase. The point is that when you do that and you have a stable process or something like our design, we need to perform manufacturing test procedure for all chips that you are going to manufacture. Okay, this is a second state, uh, stage where when you reach a high volume production, okay, then you can have, of course, after manufacturing, you are always going to have a burning just to put the design in this uh, a constant failure rate, okay, which means that you are going to submit it to burning and to eliminate infant mortality of the chips. And then you can have this incoming inspection kind of test where we are going to, uh, before integrating something, you are going to retest, okay, basically is that. Okay, so we are going to talk about uh, this specific step. Uh, the chip can be subjected to different kind of faults, parametric and functional. This is technology dependent. This is fault model oriented. Okay, so, so you can you, you can uh, develop a different kind of manufacturing test procedures oriented to fault model or more technology based. Of course, this is going to detect unique faults, and this is not going to detect this is unique faults because this is just a functional. Okay. In terms of types of manufacturing tests and uh, procedures, here we are going to talk again, uh, just to highlight it, using these uh, reruns out of memory elements, okay? You can adopt the hardware-based, software-based, or hardware-based approach when you think about a memory, okay? Think about a memory as you run memory. Um, the classic way to test this memory is applying March test. That's a software-based approach where you are going to have a, a March elements that has a sequence of writing read operations in different directions of the address decoder. And in that way, you can propagate this uh, functional faults, okay, this easy to detect faults. You can also propagate a fault that's classified as dynamic fault, that's a fault that is detected after some kind of stress of the cell. For example, if you write some value and you read it any times consecutively with the same um, cell, you can propagate these dynamic behaviors. You have some conventional faults that present this dynamic behavior. This any times that you are going to read it, we don't know, depending on the size of the fact. And this this is one of the reasons why we started to work with some kind of um, uh, uh, test strategy uh, based on the, the parametric testing, also for thin fat based estimates, because you have a lot of these dynamic behaviors as well. So this any could be 100, could be 20, depending on the size of the fact. Okay, so you need to find a way to complement the software based test as well. Okay. In terms of state of the art, okay, the, uh, when you think about March tests, you can say that, okay, this is the classic way to test the memory elements, okay, but it's time consuming depending on the size of the memory because you need to apply several March elements. Um, it's not, this kind of uh, strategy is not able to detect unique faults. 
Then in the literature, you can find some strategies like this is a sneak path sensing, okay, that was proposed a couple of years ago. The problem is that, for as Moritz mentioned, the, the problem is that here you are going to, this is testing a passive crossbar array, which means just the, with one transistor, with one main restore, and here the more most robust design is, is one T1R cell, okay? So it's not applicable again. Uh, some uh, DFT strategies designed for testability schemes that they explore access time duration, supra uh, voltage level to facilitate the propagation uh, also were uh, proposed. Uh, recently, we have this review paper of default models, but again, here is for passive crossbar arrays, one R uh, crossbars. And uh, this, um, this work that was published last year, okay, that is a low-cost DFT solution for uh, detecting, for improving the fault coverage of resistive reruns. So the idea is to uh, computationally memory-based DFT, okay, for detecting and diagnosis of faults. Okay, so uh, here in this strategy, the idea is to explore these uh, uh, reconfigurable characteristics of some parameters in order to facilitate the propagation, okay? But this is the state of the art, but uh, today I, I would like to present uh, one a specific strategy that we published, uh, started to publish in 2021, and we have a, another paper that optimized this idea, and um, today we are have a, another approach, uh, better uh, again. But the idea was, okay, we needed to be able to detect the transitional faults, conventional faults, that can be propagated at the logic level, but you also needed to be able to detect these unique faults. So what you can do? For unique faults, you needed to have a parametric testing, and for logic faults, you needed to have this March-based approach, okay? Um, so the idea was to combine both strategies. So you are going to have like a hybrid manufacturing test procedure. So you combine the execution of a predefined operating sequence with electrical measurements. So the idea is to add an on-chip sensor at memory and use this on-chip sensor to perform some measurements uh, while you are executing the predefined operating sequence. Okay, so in that way we can identify the, the deviation, the parametric deviation. That was the main idea of the approach. Okay, so here is a, one example of the sensor. Today we are working a optimized the version where we eliminated this. Um, uh, amplifier, which was a big uh, issue in terms of process variation and size as well, okay? But basically, the idea was to add some reference resistors, and the, with the comparisons, we could identify the possible misbehaviors, okay? So when the uh, ownership sensor is enabled, uh, the voltage associated the uh, to the main resistor is, is compared with this reference, and then you can classify if you are going to have like a, a, a undefined right fault, a deep fault, or a stuck at fault, and so on. So you combine both, and in that way you have this parametric measurement. Um, okay. So um, here we use it for validating the idea, and we have uh, this uh, publication here. If you are interested, it's a chapter here. Uh, we have uh, this um, case study, okay, that was a 1T1R cell implemented to use this technology and the model that you, for main research that you have at the Aachen. Uh, and the, we injected the factors in series or in parallel with the cell, okay, and in that way, we were able to show that depending on the um, uh, defect size, on the size of the resistor, you can model, we can induce, for example, a stuck at fault. And a stuck at uh, fault zero occurs when the current that flows to the main is lower than the expected one. Okay, so basically here it's possible to see the detection of a stuck at uh, zero. Okay, here is the uh, output of the sensor, and here is the Men is the uh, content, uh, uh, the voltage in the uh, main restore. Here is the reference, so you are going to compare, and in that way you can detect the stuck at fault. Here in that part is the detection of a stuck at one. Okay, just to show that in that way you can also detect the uh, conventional faults. Okay, but the main point here is it's possible to detect this unique fault 
yes, it's possible. So here it's possible to seek uh, that we model with uh, this kind of uh, resistor, depending on the size of the resistor, you are going to have a fault-free cell or you are going to have a different kind of fault, okay? You can have like, for example, for the first uh, fault-free and then you can have uh, this uh, uh, incorrect with default and then you can have, if you increase the number of the resistor, like a stuck at fault or something like that. Depending on the size you are going, depending on the magnitude, you are going to have different fault behaviors. So here, um, when you model using that, uh, here is the value between then and the comparison and uh, the detection here again, okay? So we were able to validate the idea showing that this kind of strategy, this kind of on-ship sensor is able to perform these parametric uh, measurements. And in that way, we can identify what you have at the main node that is this one, okay? In terms of value, this is us uh, comparing voltages, not the currents, okay? And uh, in that way, you can classify DP or undefined, uh, or you can just uh, detect. What you did after that, uh, we evaluated in terms of overheads, because every time that you develop something, you needed to understand not only the fault coverage of this strategy, how many faults you could detect using that, but you also needed to analyze the overheads that you are introducing. Okay, the first one is time in terms of testing, okay, T uh, test timing. Um, of course, if you compare with uh, March test, this is going to have a, a smaller time overhead, okay, but you are adding some kind of area, okay, you are adding something, some circuit, okay, so this is the, uh, this, the, the, the layout, and uh, these are some measurements, some measurements in terms of power consumption, Okay, and of course, if you, for this validation, you use the, just one T1R cell, okay? But if you think about it, it's not feasible to apply, to have one sensor for each cell. So the idea is to explore different implementations granularity, which means that you can have one sensor for each column, okay? That we published a couple of months ago, but we can also, now we are exploring the idea of having one sensor for an entire block, depending on their organization of the cell. Okay, but which means that you are going to decrease the area overhead and power overhead associated to the introduction of the sensors. Okay, so this is the optimized version where you have this, now you have a block memory now at triple three, or you have this one T1R cells here with all peripherals and you put in one chip sensor for each column. This is the design, some specific uh, parameters that you use it to limit what is high resistance state, what is low and what's undefined state. Okay, so you needed to set that. And again, the idea of compare with some references in order to be able to detect some different kind of faults. So here you have this uh, undefined white fault, uh, and here it's possible to see the value of an undefined fault in yellow, okay, what is expected, the two references, and um, the configuration of the output of the sensor uh, to indicate that you have a problem can be, of course, depending on the margin that you wanted to have. But again, the, what were the problems with this kind of approach? The main problem of the sensor is the area, okay, um, that's the reason why you needed to explore different implementation granularity, um, was the process variation associated to the amplifier here. Here, this part is an analog device, which means that, of course, you are going to have an impact related to process variation. So it's able to detect, okay? We can complement the detection with this predefined sequence. You are going to detect more faults than the March test uh, approach, okay, but you have some issues, okay. So uh, what you are doing now, we are exploring this implementation granularity. We eliminated this imp, okay, basically we have, uh, now the idea is to reuse some part of the memory, like the sense amplifier to uh, eliminate the process variation associated, okay. And um, we also, we are working because today the this approach is just a one or a zero, okay? We are evaluating the possibility of using these uh, sensors for 
online testing, which means that you can also use the idea of perform some parametric measures to understand it, how old is the device, okay, how it's, uh, it's uh, the, the degradation of this, this device. And um, we have a one collaboration with NXP that wants to use these uh, resistive runs, okay, uh, and um, they have this TSMC resistive runs manufactured with 28 nanometer technology. Of course, the, the implementation uh, the, of the, the memory, we don't know exactly what is the, the model of the main restore and the implementation, but um, all these memories they have in the at design phase, you needed to deal with this cycle to cycle variability of the device because you are going to have device to device that you are going to cover at time zero Okay, you are going to understand what is that, but you also have this cycle to cycle variability of the device, which means that sometimes it's not enough to just apply one set or one reset operation to put the device in the right resistance state or low resistance state. You need to apply like several pulses, okay? And when you apply that, you put, it, you put your device in a stable region, stable value in terms of resistance state. Okay, this is implemented, uh, it's, uh, it's implemented in the design phase of the memory. Okay, so you know what is the maximum of uh, reset and set operations that you can perform. So you are going to have like a threshold for that. And when you apply that, uh, when you are the, the device is, age, is aged, you are going to apply this limit of reset operations, for example, that's a seven for this specific memory, and you are not going to really put the device at high resistance state. And um, so the idea is to how you can monitor this degradation, okay? You need, for NXP, this is really critical because they wanted to understand how to, uh, how to monitor the degradation to understand how reliable is the device. Okay, so what you are doing at the moment is try to you reuse this kind of sensors. Okay, so you are going to have like a profile of the uh, resistance state at time zero, and then you can estimate this degradation and that when you are reaching a value closer to this threshold, this means that at a certain point the device will be aged and you are not going to switch anymore. So this is another idea to try to minimize the area overhead that's introduced by this kind of approach when you have to add something, okay? Uh, just to understand, for example, you have the test procedure, but you also have a way to try to facilitate the fault propagation of something, okay? And usually, for example, for FinTafet technology, you use these stress conditions. So depending on the, the way that you perform the, your test, if you explore different temperatures for uh, your test, or if you explore different levels of voltages, uh, considering the, 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 the admissible range of voltage that you can have, okay? You can also have um, you can also facilitate the propagation. So what you, you did here, we did a couple of experiments, okay? We are going to have a paper published in, in, the, in the coming months related to that, where you are using a 20, uh, a, a 1T1R rerun cell implemented the, with the SMC 28 nanometer, okay? But the idea here was, uh, considering this temperature, what is going to happen when you inject the defects, okay? What the changes in default behavior depending on the temperature. For the same defect size, if I'm applying the test at the more, minus 40 or 100, what is going to change in terms of fault uh, propagation? Okay, so here it's possible to see that for the same size, here is the temperature is defect size, okay? So depending on the, the temperature that I have, for example, if I think about nominal temperature here, if I have a defect of this, defect, this size, I, I cannot see any fault behavior here. And here, when I reach, for example, a defect size of this at the room temperature, I can, I can see. But here I have a really small defect that if I apply the test at minus 40, I'm going to be able to see that I have a fault, that I have a defect to that. So having a fault uh, is always associated to some kind of defect. But when I have a faulty free device, it doesn't mean that I don't have defects. I can have critical defects. The point is how to identify the criticality of these defects, 
Okay, uh, I published some works a couple of years ago related to when I have these small defects, what is the impact on the reliability, for example, for thin fat based adherence? I can see that when I have that, the device is going to age uh, faster. Okay, so I'm going to have uh, to shorter the lifetime of the device. And here it's possible to see the difference. For example, he is fault free, he's at, he's at transition fault uh, case. So depending on the temperature that I have, okay, I can have this uh, depending on the size, okay, for the same temperature, I'm going to increase, I'm going to have a different fault propagation, okay? So I can use the stress conditions to facilitate the, 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 the task of testing something at time zero, okay? So to conclude, uh, I think that you, with this talk, you, you understand that, that you need a new manufacturing test strategies. Okay, it's still uh, a big challenge because you don't really have this uh, uh, real information when you think about the manufacturing of a, a resistive run. Okay, um, it's something that you can try to do. But the point is that even if you don't have the uh, entire information. We already know that you are going to face, we are going to have some unique faults. So you needed to find a way. And the point is that for these unique faults, you needed to apply some kind of parametric testing. And if you're going to do that, you are going to add hardware overhead, okay? And so what you can do in order to minimize this overhead in terms of hardware that I may go, I can try to reuse these elements to monitor lifetime of, for, for example. In that way, you are going to minimize and you are going to be able to really understand when the device is not working properly anymore, okay? When the device is going to reach this point that is going to be stuck at or that is going to have a more random faults or more intermittent um, uh, right faults, okay? And the other point is that uh, the test here um, I believe that you are going to have a more, because today when you think about FinFET technology and the way that you do the test for memories, for example, we are going to have the same test procedure for all circuits that you produce, okay? I believe that we are going to be able for this specific technology to explore a more application-oriented test procedure, which means that depending on the environment, depending on the application, we can extract more or less. So the test procedure, the basic test procedure will be the same, but we are going to be more um, uh, worried about some kind of environment for minus 40 degrees or for 120 or something like that. We can explore this stress condition in combination with the target application to have a more efficient test, a more uh, application-oriented test procedure, okay? Um, so I'd like to thank you. Of course, when you work with testing reliability, we, we have, but uh, it's, it is an opportunity to collaborate with different people because you needed to really talk to the design guy, to the guy that's going to do the technology. Okay, so you, you need these collaborations because otherwise you cannot really develop something that is uh, suitable for testing these devices. Okay, so when you work on this subject, you needed to collaborate. So I'd like to thank all my collaborations, okay, in different levels, from device level to system level. Okay, and um, uh, from Ulihi, from Delft, from uh, uh, some companies. And um, another point is that what I saw uh, that changed when you think about testing reliability. The CMOS technology is really, uh, today when you think about reliability, you have all models, you have everything to deal with that uh, at system level, for example. But for this technology, we needed to do what was done five decades ago when you started to work with CMOS. You needed to go to the low level, you needed to go to device level and then to the circuit level and then to under, in, in, uh, understand the propagation at all these levels, what, what is happening in terms of misbehaviors, of deviation, what is happening at system level. So I think that this is the only way to address the issue at system level in a couple of years. But first of all, you need to understand all this propagation. So you need to go back to the low level, device level, manufacture, understand everything. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm open for questions.
Let's take questions now. Yeah. I think that you will need it. Ma'am, I have a couple of questions related to programming of RAM. I'm working on RAMs. Uh, if we see, uh, we need certain voltages to program RAMs, right? Uh, yeah, for the compact model that you are using, uh, we have a set voltage of 1.6 volt and reset of minus 1.7, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, in general, if we take any particular technology, it supports uh, standard voltages, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but these voltages are a bit higher than the uh, standard voltages supported mm -hmm. by particular technology. Mm -hmm. I would like to know what is the logic circuit used for generating these voltages? Okay, we, we today, for example, for this uh, CMOS based circuit that you develop, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, they required the, the, the guys that are going to manufacture the main use, they required, for example, a forming voltage up to five volts. Okay, okay. so we didn't use these core uh, devices, we used the high voltage ones. So you have the, a design with different uh, voltages, basically, it's that. For this, uh, for example, for 28 nanometer for the TSMC or even for this 130 nanometer uh, resistive run, we work with uh, around the one point uh, something that's tolerated by the, the technology. But the point is that some memories require a uh, forming voltage higher than that. And in that case, you needed to have a specific circuit for doing that. You right. needed to work with uh, the high voltage. Yes, ma'am. For example, I'm simulating uh, some array which is built with three RAMs. Mm -hmm. So I need some circuit to generate to generate these particular voltages. Uh, is that like uh, shall I go for a uh, level shifter uh, to generate these voltages? Yeah. Uh, uh, is that fine to use level shifter? I think so. Yeah. For example, you're using 130 nanometer, right, mm -hmm. ma'am? Uh, it's a PTM, it's not a V1. Okay. Uh, yeah. Or this is a PTM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so uh, the standard voltage uh, might be, as per my knowledge, it would be around like 1.2 volt. Yeah. To mm -hmm. get 1.6 volt, what is the logic circuit you're using? I would like to know that. For this one, the, the technology allows the, the voltage that you need. Okay, but as I mentioned, for the this inspection, we have this circuit that was designed using high voltage of the technology. Because you have this okay. library of high voltage and the nominal voltage, and the, usually you have it. Do you want to understand the circuit that you have? Yes, is that a level shifter or anything else I would like to know? I, I can provide you some examples of the circuit. We have this uh, forming voltage circuit that you develop in our lab, okay? okay. Um, but uh, if you see today for the uh, resistive ones that you really wanted to use, they are going, they are not going to require high voltage than this nominal plus 10% or something. For example, this TSMC, uh, resistive V1 works with the nominal voltage. Okay, we have one point one volt. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank and you. If for you want question. that, I can. I, I, we can discuss. I can provide some circuits for. for thank you, you ma'am. Uh, another question is like, uh, for example, if we take one device, it requires certain voltage to program. If I go for larger array, crossbar array or something, uh, will that be the same? The programming voltage, or will it increase or something? No, it will be the same. So if you are working with one T one R. Okay, with uh, one T one R array. If you are uh, working with passive, it, it can change because it, then you are going to have all this capacitance so, and so. On. Irrespective of the size of the array, we can go with uh, like the same programming voltage. Yes, it, technically yes. Okay, we usually have this three per three or four per four, and then you uh, include some capacitance just to simulate. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. but it, it has to work with the same. If it's not to work, if you increase it and do some simulation, it's not working, maybe you have to reprogram it to use a, a bigger pulse or something like that. I'm curious to know this because that was not happening with me. Uh, when I go for larger mm -hmm. arrays, I need to uh, really apply large voltage to program a device yeah, in a particular... You have the capacitance, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, and... you needed to... Uh, to work with that, you needed to find the way to, to scaling. Get it. Or yeah, something it, else. it happens. Okay, usually we started at single one and then you included, mm -hmm. and then you are going to see that you have a limit for this time of a reset in set. Okay, usually it's going to affect the reset operation more than set operation. Yes, because we need higher voltage. Yeah. And then you can work with that. And when you put the capacity, that's the limit of your design limit. 
Okay, you can also try to explore not just one pulse, but a sequence of pulses. For, yes. for example, for the SMC, it's possible to do with one pulse, it is, mm -hmm. but usually it's required more than one. So, ma'am, okay. one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any limit on operating frequency for these RAM devices? Operating? Yeah, it's a technology one plus 10%. Uh, because when I uh, observe the uh, like uh, read uh, time, reset time and set time uh, that uh, people are mentioning in the like papers, it is uh, in microseconds. So that is mm -hmm. basically uh, low uh, frequency when we compare with CMOS devices which operate at gigahertz of frequency. It is, we are using nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. Okay. Uh, there is no limit on like operating frequency. We can go with higher frequency also. Yeah, we can. I, I think that is a, the classic. It depends again the, the material and everything. I, uh, I can uh, provide a, a paper that was just published about uh, this the relation. Okay. If you you can send me an email or talk to me, I can provide some more details just to have a scenario about that. Sure. Yeah, but if, for sure you can explore and you can. Usually, we are using nanoseconds as time. Okay. okay. Thank you so basic. much. Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. Sir, sir. Okay. Okay. Hi, Vardam. So basically, <clears throat> you have explained about the manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, touched about the etching and the topic material deposition. So, mm -hmm. Uh, can you give some light about the photolithography? Any issues uh, or any faults can occur from that category? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, photolithography, uh, photolithography parameter, yeah. Um, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, no, but basically, we, um, we have this team, okay, that is manufacturing. Um, if you look at it, you have the, the position, but I don't have the details. I... I think that is in that image we have some data, but it's not the... No, I, I think I, I don't have here, okay? I can... One more? Yeah, yeah this, so you have some measurements. Uh, but I can pro I can provide because yeah. uh, if but the I don't intensity... remember the, the, the numbers okay. exactly. I don't remember because it happens when your intensity of light if it is more mm -hmm. uh, if the exposures are more yeah, yeah. right so yeah. the the lines of the circuitry it, it goes up mm -hmm. or down yeah. and that uh, yeah it's something it's yeah. a nanometer or something like that sure okay, okay. but uh, I don't know sure. the exact any values. Mm -hmm. Sir. Ma'am, can you please elaborate the intermittent faults, like with which extend of, uh, affect at 100 degrees Celsius, and the testing procedures are similar for intermittent faults. And also one more doubt, ma'am, does the intermittent fault manifest as delay or uh, like normal circuit faults? Intermittent faults is a, uh, it can manifest as, as unique faults as an undefined state, or you can have it as a conventional fault like a. A, um, incorrect redefault, okay, that uh, it's uh, it's uh, intermittent behavior, but uh, when you observe, you are going to have like a random redefault, okay, it's propagated logic level, or it can be uh, unique as undefined state, both. And the testing procedure for this specific technology, okay. Yeah. You have another technology can have a different intermittent faults. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, the testing procedure will remain the same or we will be able to test in application level only? Sorry? The testing procedure will be same or we will be testing at application levels? At application level, um, you are going to observe this random faults, okay? The unique faults, you are going, because what happened with these undefined faults, for example? You are going to have undefined fault state, but the point is that the, all the logic that you have, for example, the sense and flight, the, the, the value will be set at zero or, or one. But you have a parametric value because it, the sense amplifier is going to compensate in a certain way, okay? Or not, or it's going to put the one random values associated to this undefined state, okay? so. All parametric faults are not going to be propagated at system level. You are not to go. You need to to deal with that at the electrical level. But all of conventional ones, they are going to be observed at the system level. Thank you. Oh. 
so the on chip sensor that uh, you said we use for dft testing right yeah there's the for this so in example we took the 1t 1r mm-hmm. right but for different levels let's say uh, you have a crossbar array multiple crossbar arrays connected mm-hmm. to a, a cmos network right so can we use the same uh, fault model the mechanism analysis for the different layers of testing or we have to introduce different on chip sensors for for the system level what do you fault mean it's analysis layers for layers as in uh, let's say we i have a one r ram and it's connected to uh, let's say a switching network cmos okay. Mm-hmm. so my sensor is like only meant to uh, analyze faults for that network or i can yeah. scale it to no, uh, an entire crossbar <laughs> it's just for the crossbar okay okay it's the crossbar and it's connected with all the peripherals as well okay mm-hmm. so you are going to have a memory but the, the on chip sensor will be internal to the memory it's it's like a one peripheral Understood. okay but it's internal to the circuit the chip of the memory so it's you, not uh, for the external part of the application so your on chip sensor will uh, analyze look for faults for the entire crossbar and it's uh, and it's working with the cmos peripherals also that yeah. one on chip sensor yeah right correct and yeah. mm-hmm. yeah. signature understood yeah. and uh, another question that the neural network the spiking architecture that we use uh, so what are there any scalability constraints when we look at the architecture because right now we are talking at very let's say one design example but and we talk in terms of production and we are looking at architectures which are meant for spiking signal generation mm-hmm. so what are the considerations even if not the challenges for the spiking signal architecture scalability from scalability point of view okay uh, well, you are going to have a level of a density when you have a memory use it as a memory element <laughs> and if you have for, for spiking you need the analog you need the multi levels so again here i already saw some work is with seven levels but then they analyze the reliability and at a certain point you cannot distinguish more than four okay four is really optimistic okay because you have this variability and the interval is really close so i cannot say what is the is called the a real density for the, this I, i don't think that uh, we have that yet okay so is it like boiling down to the fact that the atc the analog content that we have and we are uh, facing challenge in converting to digital is it that main challenge when we talk about I, I think that density is one of them and all levels guarantee the integrity of those level from the reliability perspective it's not, we are not talking uh, yet about uh, how to integrate uh, how have uh, these the converters uh, we are just uh, talking about the reliability of the cell itself okay and the, all these uh, stages all these levels we have a big problem when you have a process variation because the intervals are really close to each other if you don't you have a kind of variability you cannot distinguish anymore if you have a variability for example in your sense amplifier as well that you need to set a threshold again you will have a problem when you have a binary uh, as used there's a memory element it's easier but it's still is a challenge okay because you you need to perform more than one reset to put in a stable state more than one set for, and again you are with the aging you are going to be closer to this threshold and yeah it's difficult for having this uh, i think that the first use of this technology will be to replace a flash or something like that to replace memory elements okay we can th- we can already think about the computation in memory okay so you can depending on the way that you apply the voltage you are going to have this large gates but for uh, achieving something more fancy like a spike network neural network we are really far yeah okay and one <laughs> one last thing that uh, other than our RAM, let's say we are taking another uh, PCM uh, technology, spin drawing. So we have any physical integrate integratability issue with the CMOS and your crossword network? Uh, no, because you are going to have a one. You are going to manufacture it in the top, 
at the back end of the line, the main resource. Okay, then you are going to connect to the transistor, and then you have all the logic. You can have a poor connection between, but it is a more manufacturing process. You can control if you have a stable manufacturing process. Of course, you need it to understand, but you are going to understand at the uh, rerun level and at the cell level if you have a problem. Okay, it's not like a, you are going to have a, uh, maybe you are going to have a problem when you have a chip of resistor run and you are going to integrate. This is another part, but it's much more inspection, testing, and not manufacturing anymore because it, integrating several elements. Because I wanted to understand, like, because our RAM is used more often compared to the other technologies for this particular application. So just wanted to understand if the on manufacturing and if there's any constraint when your this memory assistive technology in, uh, interacts with your other network that we built, the CMOS technology. That comparison, I just wanted to understand. Yeah, not really. Okay. Understood. Thanks. Okay. I have three for a question. So the first one being, I just wanted to understand how does this manufacturing typically happens, right? So I'm just coming from the industry background. So I'm com comparing with SRAM in place. So this is going to be primarily manufactured in metal layer, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the preferred metal layer? And can we use the underneath FEOL for, let's say, any of the digital circuitry, right? So how is the manufacturing is going to come in picture? Which metal layer, any preference? Okay, they usually use this hafnium oxide, tantalum oxide in terms of material. I think that at ULIFI they have it both, okay? And um, yeah, this is specific. Because you said specifically TSMC is using it. If you see a conventional technology. I, I don't know, I don't know. We're not sure. Technology of TSMC okay. because they don't provide any information about the model of the main resource. Okay, what you know is that we have a resistive run. Okay. I don't know if it's a uh, conducted filament based one or if it's area dependent. I don't know the switching mechanism. I know that's a bipolar and the general information, but I don't know if it's a conducted filament or area dependent to the implementation. I don't know the material. What you have is the chip with some, specific, uh, some specification. We have this voltage, and we know that, for example, that they are applying more than one set and reset to put in a stable because when you simulate at system level, when you integrate, you are able to see that. Okay, but then um, of course they provided the memory. At NXP, they are performing, uh, we are starting to perform some characterizations and extra measurements of these devices to extract some more information. But of course, we don't have the details about the kind of main restore, we don't know. Okay, we in our, in our simulations use the model that were developed at uh, our university based on the manufacturing process that you have there. Okay. So the okay. second question that I have is one of the way that we mimic reliability aspect is through repairability, right? So the best Vicer ECC. Can you throw some light in terms of how is that being accomplished using our RAM? Um, I didn't understand exactly what one. It's it's built in self repair, self -repair. and you have ECC. Mm -hmm. We use that typically in SRAM to overcome those ah, yeah, manufacturing defects, ah. right? So that's mm -hmm. how. With, with compensation of an area and mm -hmm. voltage, that's how we could able to mm -hmm. sustain for long, um, mm -hmm. you know, the industrial requirement. So can you throw more light on our RAM? Are those methodologies are relevant? Or how is that mitigated in our RAM? We can, we can use that, okay? There are a couple of works that explore the idea of uh, correct on codes and so on. Some kind of redundancy as well, okay? Uh, specifically, in my group, uh, we started to develop uh, some approaches for aging, monitoring. Okay, but again, uh, our idea is a little bit uh, different. We wanted to monitor. We also can explore some kind of architecture level strategy, like uh, if you think about the scratch pad of the memory and use uh, some blocks. We don't know yet because, uh, uh, for example, for FinFET as it runs, you can try to apply some kind of uh, rejuvenation with stimuli to try to uh, uh, rejuvenate your circuit, your transistors, but we don't know yet if it's possible because you don't have a model for aging for this device. It's not like if you wanted to understand the lifetime of a thing that based on the circuit in CMOS, 
you just put uh, how many years the workload, the temperature, the figure, and you can estimate. Okay, for this kind of device, you don't have. We are we are trying to do something like that, based on the measure, the inspection that you are going to do. So the idea is to perform this inspection to have an idea of the, that time is zero, and then to perform further experiments, the stressing, to understand, try to 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 build this this curve, this model. Okay, we are working on that. I have a specific project that aims to develop this okay, kind so of models. Third part of question, also a little bit touch pieces on uh, mm -hmm. aging though. So, um, but however, one of the greatest challenge of using an SRAM, um, specifically in the lower technology node and when the voltages are diminishing, right? So the beam in search is always in problem. So we always use this dual rail strategy. So SRAMs do have a bit cell array voltage, which will be slightly elevated than your uh, your normal standard sets, right? So because it couldn't hold the voltage or for the needed speed and whatnot. So now, um, touching back, th that's primarily we call it as a beam in search, which happens due to the two reasons. The first one is the process variability. And the number two is due to the aging factor, given the fact that you're not sure about the aging and the aging models are not being prevalent. I'm putting that uh, question aside, but covering for this process variation, what is your beam in search? Do you see any voltage variation that you see, uh, you know, due to this process variability, um, um, how, how big is that band, right? So because that's one of the critical factors. Can you throw more light about the beam in search on the RM devices? If you, uh, the, uh, if you have a... What, what I mean is, let's say, for a typical um, SRAM device, when you have a slow, slow, probably yeah, you need yeah. a higher mm -hmm. voltage versus mm -hmm. when you have a fast, fast device, right? So that's probably on the FE oil. But when it comes to an BE oil, Yes, there is a variation, but that's not so wide of the band it is. So mm -hmm. I would certainly like to know if, let's say, per, per se, uh, your area of an interest, let's say if you're putting 1.5 volts mm -hmm. for the programmability for set and maybe mm -hmm. what are maybe the voltage for the reset, mm -hmm. what does that mean? What's that spread of voltage uh, is across your process? Do you have that study? Yeah, we have, but we don't have like a corners for the technology. This is one thing that they wanted to work because in, in at the Uli you have these groups that they extract the model based on the characterization. So you have the model. You, of course, in the model you can set different things, and uh, we are trying to understand. But the, the point is that for setting some kind of corner. You needed to understand the impact on the performance. Is it still working properly? Function the functional is still there. So this we don't have. So the idea with this inspection is also to extrapolate in some kind of corners. So if you apply this voltage, what is going to change in terms of time? What is the time you require for your operation if you have this perform? What you can explore? Uh, you have some ideas based on the experiments and the IV curves that are extracted, but you don't have corners for this technology. Okay. We don't. Okay. Thank okay. You. I think that uh, we are um, late. Question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the yield analysis, do you have a comparison between the conventional RAMs and the R RAMs? No. <laughs> no, no, because you manufacture single devices in small crossbars. You have a, 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 you have a passive crossbar arrays. You also have... Now you have a collaboration with the IHP, that is a company, a German company, okay? Uh, and um, they manufacture resistive RAMs using one... Uh, 130 nanometer technology. Uh, I think that now we can have an idea, but the yield is not so high now. It, it's, we, it depends on, on the process. The point is that at a high, they are exploring also, not only the variability in the process, but also variability in terms of size of the device and material that you use. So, yeah, but we don't really know. Okay. Hey, so, thanks for the question. We are short of time. So much. Uh, mm -hmm. It has to present for another 15 minutes. Okay, so um, yeah, let's let's wrap this up with a shortened uh, last part on the compiler side on on, on this whole thing. So um, the the core question is how do we integrate these devices uh, in in a software stack, right? Because even if we build these nice chips, um, let's say just for the sake of the argument, they are super efficient. We just have to make them usable from a software perspective. So at the end of the day, 
no matter whether it's a spiking neural network or a, a deep neural network, it really doesn't matter. It will be something like a TensorFlow model or PyTorch model. And essentially the question will other direction are reversed. Just one second. Let me do it manually. Yeah, the, the question is basically how to get it on a chip. So essentially you have to build some sort of um, set of intermediate representations, mathematical descriptions of your, your TensorFlow model to essentially build an executable that you then can either run before you manufactured the chip in, in realistic system simulations or after manufacturing the chip um, on the actual device, uh, even if you bring it to the customer, right? That's that's the overall process here. And um, I want to give you some, some examples and some case studies on that. And um, yeah, since it's not much time left, I'm going to, to skip a few of them. But um, yeah, I think there are two two main papers to read on this if you're interested. So this is this is one. So if you get the slides at the end, just check out this paper. This is basically the only real or good um, compiler that is currently on the market. So this is um, on the market is wrong on the scientific market. This is the one regarding uh, that's a compiler for the Puma architecture that you saw at the beginning. So essentially, what they take, they have an Onyx interpreter here at the beginning to get the application inside the network. Then they run a compiler and they execute it um, via a system driver. And um, our stack internally looks a little bit different. So we are more focusing on like architecture compiler co-design. So what we are working on is um, we use a pre-trained uh, neural network model and an architecture description. And then um, we run it through our MLIR based compiler toolchain where we basically have different intermediate representations then some specific quantizations for rerun. And then finally, what we essentially do is a data flow analysis then um, reordering the operations and then mapping and scheduling it towards this multi-core setup of, of different VRAM cells and then generate code. So this is uh, we implement this in, in MLIR and Python internally um, to, to get this running. And so it's fully integrated with TensorFlow. And then we have our own cycle accurate system simulator for this. Um, and um, then basically you can get some KPI measurements from that. And um, yeah, just um, to give you some idea, what is happening here for all of those who are not very familiar with compilers? So the core parts are these four things that um, you all have to implement if you if you want to run for this. So um, yeah, intermediate representation is basically like languages to describe your problem, mathematical representations. So one example is LinArc, which is a dialect in in MLIR, and um, so basically it represents your deep neural network as a linear algebra problem. Um, same if you do a for data flow problem, you have to understand it as a graph, right? So then you would have to have a, an, another intermediate representation. Then um, for all these analog uh, or near analog computing memory technologies, you also need some specific quantizations to address this problem. And this is like a really tightly interconnected issue because uh, in, in the CMOS world, you can easily go with like your desired target quantization and run it on your hardware. But here in the analog domain, it's much more difficult because um, the devices are currently still limited in terms of their resolution. And then your actual optimization happens. So now you, you model your, your problem, like bring the DNN to the accelerator on these different like intermediate representations to do the actual mathematical operation. And then at the end, you have an understanding of where do I want to put which operation? And um, then you have to do some code generation. So um, there was this question on different um, instruction set architectures on this. So basically like something like you have a loaded load and store command, but you also have a metrics vector multiply command. So this depends a little bit on the on the um, different mathematical abstractions that you have. And so internally, what we use is a top down compiler flow. So if we want to run the compiler, we start with the front end where we do the pre-processing. Um, so the quantization, then grouping all the op operations in the graph that are in the same core. Then uh, in the middle end, we have a, like a like top-down approach, right? We start at the system level. We partition our graph, do a global mapping on this scaled out multi-core architecture and schedule this on a, on a system level for like, a, it's a little bit like a conventional multi-core um, compiler for a data flow problem, right? So that's very similar here. And then uh, we then go one step below, do a core level optimization again with the same steps. We have to partition it, schedule it, and then can run polyhedral optimization on each of these individual steps. And then finally, in the back end, we do the memory allocation, the sequencing, and the code generation for all these steps. So um, yeah, this is our internal compiler flow. And then for the Puma paper, I'm not going to go into the details, just read the paper, but it's essentially a very similar flow, which, which has the same principles 
behind it. So yeah, due to limited time, just read the paper. It's really worth taking a look at. Um, so yeah, I'm going to skip over the Puma case study. I'm just going to go into our case study. So for uh, scheduling of parallel execution. So essentially the problem here is if you have this conf 2 d layer, which you saw at the beginning in the first presentation, how do we bring it um, towards rerun? So essentially what we first do is we transform this into matrix vector multiplication, which is our first intermediate representation here. And then we have uh, vertical and horizontal groups. That's just our naming strategy. But essentially, we can now map these different uh, groups onto rerun cells. So our approach for this is that we basically, um, if you understand our overall compiler, as these are the computing and memory blocks, this is the shared memory which can uh, store intermediate results. And this was one of the questions I had at the beginning. So if we can only calculate a partial result inside the computing memory, we still need a shared SRAM memory at the end of the day to store intermediate results. And this is precisely the problem we are trying to solve in this case study. How can we do this? And as you can see here, we have like different computing memory devices which store the same, uh, which, which share, share the same kernel here in red or blue. So um, this is precisely one of the problems. And then um, if we run it like this, um, we have to understand this as a parallel execution problem. So essentially running this like, so these are the cores, like your computing memory cores. And then you could do like just very dumb sequential um, execution, even though you have parallel resources. Obviously, that's not what you want to do. So in a real world system, you want to do um, you want to resolve the dependencies uh, between your different parts of your calculation and then schedule the, the, um, the results accordingly. So this is just like one example for linear scheduling. We also have one for uh, cyclic scheduling. Again, um, go to our paper if you are interested in the intrinsic details, but essentially here we can fill um, the, the dead uh, zone a little bit better by sharing these data um, accordingly. And then um, regarding intermediate representations, what is now happening is that at the end of the day, we generate some pseudocode instructions here for the sake of understanding this. So basically, we always have load and store dem uh, commands. In the middle, we have matrix vector multiply and add commands. And then we are doing the synchronization via call and wait statements. So basically, we are understanding the synchronization between different calls as basically one call calls the other or waits for the other. And um, yeah, you will find a similar principle in the Puma architecture as well. And then I have a lot of questions on this already in the in the in the uh, break session, and I think that's a core question here. So are we actually solving like the memory wall problem here? And th the answer is somewhat no. So I'm sorry for this boring answer here, but the, it is somewhat no because at the end of the day we still have to move data into and out of the memory, right? So it's not completely solved because we have to move the input data, and this is what we wanted to understand for this. So. The target of our study was to build a system which is as industry close as possible. This is why in our system simulator, we're using an XC4 bus, which is just like the standard uh, bus, I think, that many people are using in industry. Um, we modeled it cycle accurately to understand like at which situation is um, the bus the limiting factor. And we are, again, basically running into a communication issue here. And this is what you can see on this side here. Um, on the x-axis, we are increasing the size of the crossbar so we can run more operations in the computer memory course. So we basically increase the computational capacity. And then we always give the, the maximum um, the maximum achievable theoretical speed up if there were no communication issues here in the dotted line. And then you can see at some point we will have a, a performance loss because um, our system actually has to account for communication. So this is what we see here. So for smaller crossbars, we reach the theoretical optimum, but for larger crossbars, we're actually interconnect limited. So this is one of the core research issues from a compiler perspective that you have to deal with. And then if you take a different look on the same thing here again, so um, yeah, we are now running um, the speed up to uh, divided through the speed up limit. So basically we are studying different layers of the ResNet um, and the mobile net um, set up here and want to understand how good we are. And so basically we are taking Andal's law to understand what is the maximum theoretical speed up that we can get. And then what you will see in some cases where the crossbars are small, so this is like the, the, the these examples here, we can achieve the theoretical speed up limit, but then if our computational capacity increases, then we actually throttle our multi-core system and we actually throttle it a lot, right? So if you have a bad system design, um, where like your communication resources are not aligned with your computational capacity, you see the same issues as you see in today's systems. And this is one of the core 
strategies that we are taking a look at how to do this architecture compiler co-optimization to understand how even if we can use very efficient analog compute units in a digital system, we still have to somewhat integrate it into the digital world and we still face the same issues as we face today with, with fully digital systems. And yeah, so I hope this gives you a nice perspective on this. And just to, to wrap this um, whole up, um, we can actually run these systems and I want to show you a small demonstrator. So what we did is um, in our lab, we built this nice uh, 20 cross 20 centimeter development board essentially, which has an FMC connector here to connect to an FPGA. And then you have a computer memory chip, analog chip uh, in the middle. So you can connect to different technologies from different vendors. And we have uh, just co conventional ADCs and DACs you can buy off the shelf um, allocated here. So basically now we can um, load some um, weight matrices into this chip and actually run it. And we wanted to use this for IoT applications. So we built, uh, it's a little bit 90s technology. We only use MNIST, so don't kill me. For all the guys who love ML, that's a very simple example, I know. Uh, but anyways, we built like a letter input for a smartwatch as you would find it on an Apple smartwatch and uh, wanted to show that this technology actually is working. And um, yeah, here we can show the um, like the demo video for this. So basically we implemented an uh, interface on a laptop there where you can write the number so that it looks fancy. And then here we have our development board, which is connected to a microcontroller with a lot of cables um, still in this early stage of the demonstrator. And here we have a computer memory chip manufactured by a French uh, vendor, CIE Leite. Um, some of you might have heard of them. They are very closely related to SD microelectronics. And um, so this is, they call this MAT, 200 technology. And so we could offload parts of this neural network onto this uh, computer memory chip and actually show that you can use this technology and it's actually running something somewhat useful, but um, realistic. And so the mapping here in this example was still manually, but uh, currently we are developing a second iteration of this board in the lab, um, which is currently in manufacturing, which will be integrated with our SDK so that you can like take a um, more interesting workload and then show that it also runs on, on larger systems. So yeah, I hope I could link this all a little bit for you so that you have a broad understanding of, of the, the challenges that you see in the digital domain versus the analog domain here and um, bring this back to a system level and that you can at the end also see it's actually running something, but as you can imagine, just using a Raspberry Pi is more efficient than this, right? So um, it's still early technology and um, in, a, in a research stage. So um, yeah. I hope this answers most of the questions that came. I think you was the person who asked this um, in, in the first session on compilers. And uh, for any other questions, I'm open just after this uh, session if you have more questions um, outside of the scope. So yeah, thank you for your kind attention and have a good day, everyone. Questions? Around the room, we'll take one or two questions quickly. We are out of time already. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, are the loads that you are considering limited to CNNs, or uh, there is a way, like moving forward, these will be RNNs and LSTMs, and those will be supported by these kind of technologies? Yeah, so uh, we're currently considering only CNNs just for the sake of having easy life and development. Right. Um, so the compiler is also um, compatible to recurrent neural networks because that's only a data flow problem. Where it gets more challenging is like LSTMs um, where you have to, um, or transformers, where you have to rewrite the devices, where it's not like filter times input and you store the filter and then you run the input over it. Then it gets more challenging and VRAM is um, at the moment not the most efficient um, technology. Also, you are quite uh, limited in terms of um, um, depth-wise first convolutions, because there the data dependency is actually not in favor of, of the way the computer memory works. So in my opinion, this is still an unsolved problem. So you'll find one or two papers that just claim it's not possible. <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's not possible, but uh, they claim this. But in general, um, it's an unsolved problem how to do this efficiently. Yeah. Thank you. One more question. Can you throw uh, more insight about this AXA4 based bottleneck, right? So you have been just yeah. kind of flashing through it. Can you just add more details in terms of how is that limiting your overall performance? 
Yes, I can. Um, yeah, so in general, it's limiting our overall performance. Um, yeah, let me go back to this slide. I think that's more intuitive. Um, so it's so basically, we're giving it more compute resources, right? So we can run more um, neurons in parallel on the rerun cores, and then you have to get the data in and out of these cores. And um, then we're using an AXE4 bus with a certain given bus width uh, of 4 to 32 bytes here. And then we are running a cycle accurate model of the bus, and then we have a, like, a model for our arbitration, and then we see that arbitration delay actually takes um, uh, more and more space, room inside our computation. So here at the beginning, the, the rerun crossbars are slow enough that um, your uh, bus system is not limiting your overall performance, while here you actually generate much more data than your bus system can actually take. So this is ex explaining the, the gap between the theoretical optimum, if the bus would just be like unlimited uh, resources on the bus and you can just um, communicate all results immediately, versus um, the, the actual setup where you have to now wait for arbitration for your bus, and this kills like 80% of your performance in one of these examples, yeah. So one solution is to give it a larger bus again. <laughs> but then again, we are somehow in this discussion of um, are we actually solving the problem? Because this is the same you could argue for uh, conventional for human architectures. So just give it a larger bus with more bandwidth towards your memory. And I think this is not the overall solution we want. So what we are trying to do is this architecture compiler co-optimization where we really understand this problem and then map the neurons in a, in a more optimal way to, to um, reduce at least the impact of the communication system. Yeah. Yes. So these, uh, these are simulation results, right? Excuse me. These are simulation. are simulation results, and, correct? Uh, yeah. Are these fully weight stationary or partially weight stationary? No, fully weight stationary. Fully weight stationary. Yeah. So we are short of time. Maybe we'll yeah. close the session and uh, now Satya, please facilitate the presenters. I, I would like to invite Malpreet to facilitate the presenters. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Moritz and uh, Dr. Leticia. Thank you very much for coming here. It was really a pleasure having you for the session. I think we all had a good uh, interaction uh, and really happy to interact with you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Now we will break the break for the lunch. So lunch is provided behind this place. So you need to drop your lunch coupon in the uh, <laughs> lunch area. Okay. So then uh, we will start next session an afternoon tutorial at exactly 1.30 in the same place. We can reassemble here at 1.30. <laughs>